Good evening. This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, May 16th, 2023. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Roa Hassan. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, and Verizon Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the May 16th agenda. Board members, may I have a motion to add consideration of the appointment of superintendent of schools as agenda item E3 under administrative appointments? So moved, Harvey. Thank you. May I have a second? Second, second Savoy. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the addition? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favor is 10. Thank you. Motion carries. The revised agenda is approved and the uh, is approved. Early this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and conduct collective bargaining negotiations, or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Chair Lichter. Good evening. Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D3? So move, Pumphrey. Thank you. May I have a second? Second, Savoy. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favor is 10. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Madam Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Principal of Dogwood Elementary School, Assistant Principal Parkville High School, and Principal Edgemere Elementary School. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, one second. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments? So moved. Do I have a second? Second, Pumphrey. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. F favors 10. Motion carries. Dr. Williams? Thank you. Our first appointee is Novella P. Abels, 
as the principal of Dogwood Elementary School. And joining her tonight is her hub husband, Gerard Abels. Please stand. Prior to this appointment, Mrs. Abel served BCPS for over 24 years. Most recently, she served as the assistant principal of Church Lane Elementary Technology School. She served as the assistant principal at Woodmore Elementary School and teacher at McCormick Elementary School, Wynan Elementary School, Rogers Forge Elementary School, and Millbrook. Congratulations, Mrs. Abels, as our new principal of Dogwood Elementary School. Our next appointee is Courtney A. Fleming as the assistant principal at Parkville High School. And joining her tonight is her partner, T.C. Cosby. Please stand. Oh. <laughs> Prior to this appointment, Ms. Fleming served BCPS for over 15 years. Most recently, she served as a social studies teacher at Catonsville High School and also a social studies teacher at Parkville High School. Congratulations, Ms. Fleming, as our new assistant principal at Parkville High School. Our next appointee is Alexander P. Paradise as the principal of Edgemere Elementary School. And joining him tonight is his wife, Amy Paradise. There you are. Was acknowledged. <laughs> Prior to this appointment, Mr. Paradise served BCPS for over 11 years. Most recently, he served as an assistant principal at Dundalk Elementary School and Wellwood International School. He was a teacher of special education and classroom teacher at Cromwell Valley Elementary School. Congratulations, Mr. Paradise, as our new principal of Edgemere Elementary School. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the appointment of superintendent of schools. May I have a motion to appoint Dr. Miriam A. Yarbrough as the superintendent of schools for Baltimore <coughs> County Public Schools for a four-year term beginning July 1st, 2023, contingent upon the approval by the State Superintendent of Schools and the successful negotiation of an employment contract. So moved, Harvey. Second, thank, Savoy. Thank you, thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Domanowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favor is 10. Congratulations on your appointment, Dr. Yarbrough. The members of the Board of Education are looking forward to working with you and supporting you throughout your tenure as superintendent of BCPS. I'm not finished. This, jo this job won't be easy. <laughs> this job won't be easy. There is much work ahead of us, and we have 111,000 students and over 20,000 staff counting on us as a Board of Education and you as our incoming superintendent to get this job done. Appointing a superintendent is the most important job we have as a board and one that we take very seriously. On behalf of the board, I want to acknowledge and express our gratitude and appreciation for the hundreds of staff parents, students, and stakeholders who are active participants in this search process. Members of Team BCPS take great pride in this school system and care deeply about the well-being and success of students and staff. The community shared their candid thoughts and opinions on the type of leader they wanted for the next superintendent. 
We held public forums, focus groups, and shared an online survey for members of Team BCPS to complete. While we won't all agree, I want to assure the community that we heard you and we selected Dr. Yarbrough as our next superintendent because she has a clear, clear vision and embodies much of what we heard the community highlights as the desired characteristics and skills of the incoming superintendent. Dr. Yarbrough distinguished herself from among the other finalists with her strong ties to the community, having begun her career here more than 26 years ago in Baltimore County. With her range of school-based and central office leadership experience, and with her deep commitment to fostering academic and operational excellence, she understands the challenges that we face and has an unwavering belief that all students can and will succeed when given access to high quality instruction, strategic resources, and comprehensive support. For us to move our system forward, we must all come together, parents, staff, students, and stakeholders alike, and work in partnership to achieve the shared vision of excellence for BCPS. The Board of Ed looks forward to joining Dr. Yarbrough as she connects with parents, staff, business education, civic and community leaders, and the community as superintendent at public meetings that will be scheduled in the near future. Thank you, and now I'd like to offer Dr. Yarbrough an opportunity to share a few remarks. Thank you again, Board Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the Board of Education. I am truly grateful and honored for this opportunity to work alongside of you to lead Baltimore County Public Schools. I shared in the past that I was here as a first year teacher, and I remember when Baltimore County Public Schools, we were at the top of the state. It is my intention to work together with you, the community, our staff, all stakeholders and our students first and foremost to get back to the top of the state and the nation. You have my word. I want to thank Dr. Williams for your leadership and service to Baltimore County Public Schools. The needs of Team BCPS students, staff, and the system are growing and there are undoubtedly challenges that we face. Nevertheless, I believe in our boundless potential if we work together to meet the needs of our students and staff moving forward. We will improve and accelerate student learning. I appreciate, thank you. I appreciate the support I have received from members of Team BCPS, the community, county government, and lawmakers, thank you so much for everyone who is here today in this room, in the overflow. Yes. I truly appreciate you. Thank you so much. I am most grateful to my family, my four children, loved ones, and colleagues who believe in me and have supported me throughout this process. I'm committed to engaging stakeholders across Team BCPS. That will continue. Face-to-face, -face, direct conversations. I will empower your voices so that you are part of the problem solving. As Chair Lichter stated, we must all come together to solve these challenges that face us. I look forward in the coming weeks to meet with many members of Team BCPS. I would love to hear from you directly and work together to determine our next steps in service of students, staff, and community. I look forward to meeting with students, staff, parents, businesses, education, civic leaders, and many more stakeholders over the next several months. Again, I truly thank you for your support, and I thank you for putting your faith in me. I promise you that my commitment is to all of our students in Team BCPS. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. 
The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we refer, refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. Online registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday. For anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting, Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. No speaker substitutions will be allowed. For those who are not selected through the online registration, a wait list sign-up sheet was available 30 minutes prior to the meeting. If a registered speaker is absent, speaker slots will be reassigned from the wait list so that the 10 speaker slots are allocated. In accordance with recommendations from the Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and the Office of School Safety, we have implemented the following safety and security protocols to enhance the safety of all attendees. Participants should be seated in the room during meetings. Individuals who need to stand should go out into the hallway to do so. Participants should not approach the table unless called upon to speak and should not approach the dais. While we appreciate the creativity many have shown during their presentations, materials brought to the table are limited to electronic devices, presentation papers, and posters no larger than 11 by 14 inches. Other items should be left on your seat. Information to be given to the board to, is to be handed to the staff member who is seated in the front area of the meeting space. Information for other participants is to be left on the designated table outside in the hall. In the event of an emergency that requires an emergency response, such as a lockdown, lockout, or evacuation, staff from the Office of School Safety will direct participants. If evacuating, participants will exit through the rear or front door in an orderly manner, leave the building, and cross over to the parking lot or other safe distance as warranted. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personnel remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee or subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see the time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of the time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. Whew, okay. It is the practice of this board to allow elected officials to provide their comments to the board. And we have two elected officials with us this evening. So I'd like to invite Delegate Cheryl Pastor to come and provide some remarks. Good evening, Delegate Pastor. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and Vice Chair Harvey, <laughs> and Dr. Williams, wherever he is. Tonight, you have chosen a new superintendent for BP, BCPS. Bravo. <laughs> Let me say that again. Bravo. <laughs> Having sat in two seats up there, I know the hopefulness and the tumult that goes into making that decision. It takes time, it takes commitment, and it takes courage. Yes, courage. It takes the courage to face, that is, if you did, your biases, your prejudices, your fears, your peers, the courage to face you. Without looking into a mirror, a collection of people might well find itself on a very slippery and distasteful slope.
But whatever your experience, a decision has been made, a decision out of what I hope was based on love for children, all children, all on different roads, each trying to get to the same end, which is being a meaningful part of a community, being a productive citizen, being a part of a global society, unafraid of the present and the future. In the pulse of mourning, Maya Angelou said, history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived. But if faced with courage, and I add truth, need not be lived again. We all must count on you to remember that you are not here for yourselves, but for our children, <laughs> our communities, the present and future, which we will continue to share together, together as equal partners in this county, in this state, in this country, in this world, yes. period, exclamation point. <laughs> in Philippians, it says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. And I add, for children, for ourselves, for all of us, for our present, and our future. There is a season for everything. Yes, a time to plant, and tonight, yes. as led by the words in Ecclesiastes, we are planting new seeds of hope for children, community, the world. Tonight, we are joined here and surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who have come out tonight by faith, having stripped off every unnecessary weight to assure you that we are here to support our students by supporting Dr. Yarbrough, yeah. the board, and all of you who want to ensure a strong school system, or we will not go away. We will not fear, we will not be intimidated, and we will not give up. Together, lifting up our hearts for this new beginning, this new opportunity, let us run with endurance and active persistence the race that is set before us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And our next speaker is Delegate Sheila Ruth. Thank you for being here. Thank, th thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, uh, members of the board, um, Dr. Williams, Dr. Yarbrough. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I won't take up much of your time. I'm here in support of Dr. Yarbrough. Um, I wanted to congratulate you and thank you on your selection. Um, she has the, the right skills and experience and community connections to lead us through these times, to help us face our challenges, and to help with the continuing the implementation of the blueprint. And I'm truly excited to see the future of BCPS under her leadership. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for being here. Our next speaker is Marietta English from the NAACP of Baltimore County. Whew. Having to follow my Sora. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairwoman Lecter, Vice Chair Harvey, members of the board, and Superintendent. Attendant Williams. My name is Marietta English and I chair the NAACP Baltimore County AXO program and I'm also chair of the Education Committee. I am pleased to inform you that we held our competition on Saturday, April 29th at Newtown High School. 
And we had 10 local gold medal winners. Clap! That is wonderful. Thank you. I would like to thank Dr. Williams for attending the event and, and the support of Baltimore County Public Schools. We could not have done this without the support of Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, Mr. Um, Ambush at Newtown was so helpful. And it was, it was a great success. We had 53 entry, entries in humanities, performing arts, and the visual arts. We will continue to work on getting students to compete in the STEM area. But we are on our way to Boston for gold medals. And I'm sure we will bring home gold medals. We have always done that in the past, and we look forward to doing that in the future. Now, as education chair of the branch, we are in support of Dr. Miriam Yarbrough as our next superintendent for Baltimore City, Baltimore County Public Schools. She is the best qualified. She knows the system. And she has a plan that she will carry us into the next decade. And as Spike Lee say, I would say, you did the right thing by hiring her. Thank you so very much. And I look forward to working with Dr. Yarbrough with AXO. And I certainly hope you will attend our competition next year, as Dr. Williams was the first superintendent to attend our competition in the 20 years that I've been doing it. So thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brian Epps from AFSCME. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and the Board of Education. My name is Brian Epps. I'm the president of ASME, the second largest union here in BCPS. I am here today in support of our new elected superintendent, Dr. <laughs> Yarborough, who have been a champion for ASME. Uh, she started out with us with transportation. As many of you know, we heard, hear, heard that there was a lot of problems with transportation. She got with Dr. Grimm, and they fixed it. She, they were complaining the kids were not being picked up or dropped off, but she fixed the problem. I also represent a large group of people of the support staff that over the, since the pandemic, a lot of us lost out, well, was not able to take our vacation because of the shortages that we have arrived. And because of the leadership of Dr. Yarborough, she seemed fit that we were able to carry over our vacation and also sell vacation back. First time happened in the history of Baltimore County. The members I've served are here for the kids and because they're here for the kids, they forgave their vacation to get the job done, that our schools will be ready for the kids. And under her leadership, she made sure we did not lose that time. Dr. Yarborough, we have started a great work, and I'm looking to continue the work that we have to do. There's a lot more work to do, and I'm looking to join with you to start it. Congratulations again, Dr. Yarborough. Thank you. Our next, our next speaker is Cindy Sexton from TAPCO. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lecter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. Authentic collaboration and relationships, a true plan to increase academic achievement, a way to get past the culture of fear that still persists, a transparent budget, a transparent budget, <laughs> <laughs> and the skills to work with stakeholders at every level. These are some of the qualities our superintendent must have, always with a focus on what we need to recruit and retain our educators so they are there for our students. I believe that Dr. Williams, Dr. Williams does possess, but Dr. Yarbrough possesses these qualities and will use them for the students, staff, and community of BCPS. Congratulations, Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you for the work we have done so far, and yes, there is more to do. I look forward to our continued collaboration as we face the challenges and opportunities together. But now to business. As we close out this school year, I ask that you look one last time at our negotiations. We continue to see educators leaving our system and many are going to other systems. We asked our members to sign a petition 
and asking for a resolution to our compensation negotiations that will truly work to keep our educators here in BCPS so we can serve our students. More than 1,000 educators did sign this. Uh, hopefully that won't match the number of people resigning this year, but that number is climbing and it scares me for our students. We opted for this tactic as opposed to emailing you, the board, because I know with the superintendent search, new board members, and all the end of year activities, inundating your emails would not have been preferable to you. Mr. Uh, Rod over there has mentioned that to me. So uh, you're welcome. We just did the petition instead. But our educators want to stay here. They want to be there for our students. Some schools have more than 50% of their resignations actually leaving for other school systems. Several others have 25 to 50% of their staff resigning and going to other school systems. Let's do what we can now before we lose more so we can retain the educators we have. So let's finish this now so our new superintendent can have a clean slate and not have to come in and face negotiations on top of all the other issues that need to be addressed. Let's finish this strong for our educators because our students need them and our focus must always be on them first. Again, congratulations, Dr. Yarborough, and thank you all. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeanette Young from ESPBC. Good evening. Good evening. Chairwoman Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, I know you're in the house. Congratulations, Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jeanette Young. I'm the president of the Education Support Professionals of Baltimore County, ESPBC. ESPBC extend its uh, support to Dr. Yarbrough as the next superintendent. While we acknowledge the past few years have not been smooth sailing, ESPBC recognized that Dr. Yarborough has demonstrated a willingness to work to serve all students in all schools constituencies group. She's laser focused on student achievement. Dr. Yarborough has demonstrated her capacity to work well with ESPBC. Through our work, we have identified and addressed barriers that have impacted our ability to support schools and offices in, in an efficient and effective manner. As a result of our ongoing co collaboration, we were able to create plausible solutions, some of which were able to be implemented immediately and others in the future. She works with ESPBC with the understanding that student achievement is at the forefront. For example, providing guidance to administrators and supervisors around substituting when substitutes were not available and supporting our annual professional development training for paraeducators, offers professionals, and interpreters. These trainings have provided a platform for teachers and parents to work collaboratively and effectively for student success. For these reasons and many more, ESPBC support Dr. Yarborough as our superintendent. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Derek Burnett. Mr. Burnett. Our next speaker is former board chair, Makita Scott. So, Ms. Scott. Good evening. Great. Good Welcome. evening. Thank you very much. And um, congratulations, Dr. Yarborough. I would also like to, um, he's not here, but thank Dr. Williams for everything that he's done and his leadership. And um, he is also appreciated. So, um, so Dr. Williams, board members, educators, students, and community members, I would like to thank you all for your continued dedication to shaping and guiding the education of our children. Today, I would like to talk about an issue that lies at the very foundation of our schools and greatly impacts the trajectory of our students' lives, equity. Equity at its core is about creating a level playing field for everyone, regardless of their race, 
gender, socioeconomic background, or any other factor that might otherwise disadvantage them in the pursuit of their education. It is about removing barriers and giving every student the opportunity to excel, prosper, and succeed in today's competitive, globalized world. Now, some of you may argue that focusing on equity somehow diminishes what it means to achieve success and that these efforts ultimately hinder progress. To them, I ask, progress for whom? Is it truly progress if only a few select have access to knowledge and essential resources, while the vast majority are left behind, unable to attain any real form of empowerment or success? I believe that every student has the right to, quality, to a quality education and that no student should be left behind or marginalized simply because of who they are, where they come from, or because of the color of their skin. This belief is the, in the principle of equity has propelled countless education reforms across the globe, and it is time that we foster genuine equity in our educational system at BCPS. Equity is not a buzzword that can be used only when it's convenient. We must recognize that to achieve true equity, diversity and inclusion must thrive. We embrace our differences, create space for dialogue, and actively work to break down barriers that keep certain students from realizing their full potential. This requires not just policies and programs that seek to ensure equal access to education and opportunities, but also commitment to understanding the unique lived experiences of our students, families, and community members. Only when we firmly dedicate ourselves to working with and for the communities that we serve can we begin to tear down the systemic obstacles that have long impeded access to equity, education, and opportunities. This sport must begin at the ground level by looking critically at everything that is essential to maintaining a diverse faculty, staff, and students with varied backgrounds. When students see themselves reflected in their teachers and administrators, they are more likely to view their own potential for success differently. Furthermore, a diverse educational workforce brings valuable perspective to enlarge the conversation and contribute to richer, more empathic learning environments. Together, we have the power to create a just and inclusive BCPS community where every one of our students will succeed. Thank you. Our next speaker is also former board member Molly Joes. Couldn't stay away, right? <laughs> good evening. It's good to be back. Good evening. <laughs> good evening, Dr. Williams and members of the board. Firstly, congratulations and welcome to Dr. Yarbrough. Um, also, congratulations to all of the newly appointed board members. I know you had to hit the ground running, so thank you. Tonight, the division of CNI will be bringing for approval the new ELA curriculum. We know that our homegrown curriculum is not meeting state standards. Last year, the previous board that I served on did not approve the My View literacy, despite the insistence of many educators. It is incumbent on this board to approve this contract to provide an updated curriculum for our children. BCPS Department of Transportation drivers and staff take a bow. As a parent, I am impressed by how efficiently the Department of Transportation has been functioning since the beginning of this academic year. The turnaround has been transformational and transporting over 80,000 students. 80,000 students every single day is not a small feat. Well done, Team BCPS. Um, having been uh, over three years ago on the board, we formed an equity committee, and I know Ms. Scott touched on that much more eloquently than I will, but to hear folks talk about the equity committee should be disbanded or ironically is not needed is based on misinformation and ignorance. Equity, like she said, is not about race. It's not about gender or diversity. It's about including the excluded groups in education children who've been left out of our education system for far too long due to politics, policies, and economic conditions. If you're poor, come from a single parent household, come from a family without a college education, have special needs, have learning disabilities, you're more likely to drop out of school. Equity is simply making sure that we provide all of our children those resources that they need to succeed in this world. So I hope this board continues the work of achieving equity with a reminder that our very first board policy, Equity 100, is equity, and that undergirds all other board policies. 
Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gloria Marrow. Good evening. Good evening. Congratulations, Dr. First, let me say good evening to the board, Dr. Williams. I am in a unique position, having been an educator for over 50 years. And I think I do understand what some of the problems are in dealing with schools and community and students and the like. But we are here to help because our country deserves the best. I am also here to express my sincerest thanks for the service that this board does for the children who attend Baltimore County Public Schools, and more especially, for and to Dr. Williams, the superintendent, who has demonstrated outstanding service to our educational community for teachers, administrators, and our children. He has done this in some of the most challenging times that Baltimore County has ever experienced. Not to mention that this country has gone through some challenging times and still will be. Those challenges came in forms of health, finances, and racial diversities. He met those times. Those challenges came not unexpected, but certainly not wanted. Finally, I'd like to extol kudos to Dr. Williams for the following accomplishments. One, he orchestrated record funding for our schools. Two, he fostered diversification of and in the schools, diversification of leaders and staffs. Three, he encouraged and wove equity into the fabric of his tenure. Four, he positioned the Baltimore County Public Schools of Baltimore County to move forward according to a current and accepted educational pathos. Five, he initiated the Black Boys Program in the schools to help them meet the four pillars of education, which are learning to know, learning to do, learning to live, and learning to be. Finally, Dr. Williams encouraged expanding attention to educational achievement gaps among our children to help them acquire knowledge and understanding, a foundation in developing good thinking and critical skills. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak to this board. I hope it will not be my last time because I will be watching. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And next speaker is Bash Farone. Dr. Farone? It's okay. Good evening to all. Congratulations, Dr. Yarborough. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And I really, truly congratulate all of you for making the wise decision. Nobody told me. I felt it. I trusted you. And you did it. Thank you. I want to talk to you today about equity and equality that eloquently has been stated by Ms. Pastor, Delegate Pastor, and Ms. Nikita Scott. Three minutes for everyone is equal. However, there are still officials in the school system who believe that the treatment of one minority religion better than others is still the right thing to do. So I want to remind you, many of you are new, that for a quarter of a century here, I watched my three kids in Baltimore County Public School 
their holidays being ignored in favor of another minority religion. When Dr. Berger was superintendent, he promised me that he will close the school on the Jewish holidays equal to the Muslim holidays. But when it came to the Board of Education, he recommended only the Jewish holidays. And that lasted for almost 20 years. So to set the record straight, the data that relates to one religion or the other is fake. It's not really objective data. A past president of this board presented data, and that data was that he looks from his window on the Jewish holidays, and he finds that the school bus comes through with very few students in it. And that's the justification for closing on one minority holiday and not the other. You are a new board. And you may not really know what I went through, my kids went through, and all the people behind me that are standing went through, and thousands more. We are all asking for equality. Zero equals zero, one equals one, two equals two. It really should be straightforward, easy. That's what's fair. No lubrication of the data, no massaging of the data, no making assumptions that are personal assumptions, subjectives, and so forth. I really implore on you to implement what Delegate Cheryl Pastor and Ms. Scott has talked to you about equity and equality. I heard it for so long, and I want it to be applied. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dwight Joseph. Good evening. Good evening. Greetings, uh, Chair Littner, uh, Vice Chair Harvey, fellow board members, uh, Superintendent Dr. Williams. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today in uh, support for Dr. Yarborough. Congratulations. Uh, let me first take the um, privilege of thanking Dr. Williams uh, personally for uh, the service that you have done for Baltimore County Schools and your dedication and commitment to our kids. Um, personally, for my kids as well and my family, you have tremendously impacted our lives. So I want to thank you and I wish you, your wife, and kids the very best in your next uh, efforts moving forward. Um, I came here to support Dr. Yarborough today, and I want to thank the board for doing its due diligence and listening to our communities and, and making the right decision in selecting a leader that's going to continue to do the hard work for our kids and our staff and continue to put them first um, and continue to do so while building the continue building those relationships with our communities that's so important to achieving the goals of Baltimore County school system um, I thank you the board for continual your efforts as well for providing all the resources and and efforts that has uh, that we needed during the pandemic years, it's been rough on a lot of school system, and I know sometimes you guys don't get the credit that you deserve in front of the entire school system. So from a parent in the system who's been living in the county for 22 years and had two kids that, one that matriculated and graduated and is doing quite well in college, and the other one that's a junior in, in high school now and also uh, plan to attend the STEM field, I want to thank you. Um, and uh, we're here to support as parents and I uh, wish you, Dr. Yarbar, all the best to you and your family. Thank you both. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Serhoff. Good evening. Good evening. First of all, congratulations to Dr. Yarborough. 
I hope to work with you over the next four years in a positive manner. Um, I'm here tonight, as usual, to talk about special education in regards to quality. Um, I attended recently an in-person meeting of the Special Ed Citizens Advisory Committee, and several of us who are advocates thought that that was going to be poorly attended. Thankfully, it was a packed house. Um, unfortunately, the biggest item that I heard and took away from that meeting is the lack of a feeling that parents were a partner and being a welcomed partner. Um, there was a lack of information provided to parents and parents were saying, if I only had had that information about the programs, about the services, about what the process is, I would have felt more comfortable. That is partially has to do with equity. As an advocate, I work with parents. Most of my clients are single parents. Most of my clients are minorities. And a lot of my parents have a difficulty affording the services of my colleagues and have a difficulty affording my services. And they feel marginalized. They feel that they're not getting the same information that their non-disabled peers to their kids are getting. That's not equality. If I have a child who has a disability and my child wants to go to a magnet program or be involved in CTE or be involved in dual enrollment, my child should have that same ability. And that's not happening. If we're gonna, just, if we're gonna try to be more, more equity in this county, we have to make sure that that changes yesterday so that more parents don't feel that their children are not equal participants and that they are not welcome in this county. And I speak from experience. Thank you. Our next speaker is Clarissa Taylor Jackson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Mr. Williams, uh, Superintendent Williams to the entire board. Um, I am here because in full transparency, some of those ladies in red back there summoned me um, and the entire NPHC. I am the president of the National Panhellenic Council Metropolitan Baltimore. Will all the members of NPHC Metropolitan Baltimore please stand? If you're Greek at all, if you came in your colors, please stand for me. Dr. Yarborough, or Dr. Yarbrough, sorry. Dr. Yarbrough, I'm here because I was summoned to come and support you. Um, I thank this board for making the right decision. Um, but I, was, I came here ready to say all the things and talk about all her accomplishments, but you've done it already. You've listened to, you've read the, the letters. Um, you've heard the testimony already. So I just thank you for doing what you were, what you were supposed to do. So amen for that. Um, so now I want to be here um, on behalf of the council again to thank Dr. Williams for his work and, and thank you um, for everything that you have done and wish you well on your next journey. And to remind, I'm going to take this opportunity to um, welcome the new board members and, and thank you for um, this journey that you've begun. Also thank the new principals or the, those who've been promoted. Um, NPHC Metropolitan Baltimore members are in your schools. This is the second time I've come here to say that very thing. We are in your schools, both in, uh, in school time and out of school time, providing service to your teachers, 
be bringing in uh, supplies as necessary, providing our physical resources at, and our expertise as it makes sense, um, and then again, uh, supporting your out of school time programming. Um, for those newly promoted uh, principals, um, think of us, if we're not in your schools, please think of us. We want to be in your schools. You should partner with us. We have um, talent that we are ready to use. In PHC, again, we are historically black Greek letter organizations, many of whom have been around for over 100 years. My sorority, Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, is 100 years. Um, we are still celebrating 100 years. Um, and we, are, we were founded by educators. So many of our, my chapter members, I'm also the president of the Baltimore County chapter of Sigma Gamma Sorority Incorporated. Many of my members are teachers in your schools. But I do want to list very quickly the schools that the, at least of the 22 members of NPHC um, chapter, the chapters um, that represent thousands of Greek letter, um, Greek members, here are the schools that the 10 or so Baltimore County chapters support. Hepville Elementary, Johnny Cake, uh, Pahatton, um, Deer Park Middle, Randallstown, Newtown, Randallstown, oh, I said Randallstown already, and Dundalk High School, Sollers Point. We're here, we want to be in more schools, and we are ready to support you. Thank you very much. Since there were three speakers absent, we will now call from the public comment wait list, and the first speaker is Scott Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins? Oh, good evening. Good evening. I didn't think I was going to get a chance to speak, so we'll just wait. You're number here. one. <laughs> <laughs> um, congratulations, Dr. Arbor. I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, but as a lifelong Baltimore County student that went to Parkville High School, I wish you well. And uh, <laughs> my friend back here, don't like Parkville. But anyway, um, so I just wanted to come tonight. I know we're going to talk tomorrow. I know the board will be at the uh, Northeast uh, Central Boundary Study tomorrow night. I just want to try to clear up, make sure that any misperceptions that have gone on about what's gone into that study and what's going into that committee, we're going to try to clear those up, obviously, tomorrow night. I also want to really stress Rule 1280. Um, I think what happened at the Golden Ring public meeting, where only a few people showed up, shows, I think, a big weakness in 1280. I think the reason there was five times as much public um, survey participation in the boundary study as there was in the superintendent search was because we got the elementary schools involved. If you're doing a middle school boundary study and the middle schools are the only ones on the committee, the only ones a part of the discussion, if you have a seventh or eighth grader, doesn't really matter. If you have a child already in the middle school, your elementary school child can go to that middle school. They get grandfathered in um, to go there as well. So I think the real affected schools are the elementary schools. And I think, obviously, it's been a long time since we've had a middle school boundary study. I graduated in 93. I don't think there's been one um, since then. Um, but I think the issue is, by having the elementary schools there, they truly are the affected students. I know Ms. Frempong last time um, intimated that there was only really one community. Um, I think our community was strong, but I think there was a lot of them. We, we spent a lot of time working with Gunpowder and Red House Run and Rossville and Mays Chapel and Warren and Hampton, and uh, I can name other schools, with working with Perry Hall Middle and Ridgely and Cockeysville and really trying to find a solution that worked when 30,000 students were involved in over 55 schools. It's hard, but I think the fact um, that there was 70% support it was support across the board in all in um, map A, which became E because of a couple tweaks that the community wanted. Um, there was weighted support. Nine of the 10 schools supported that map. None of the other maps were supported by, I think, more than one or two of the, um, the areas. And the one school that didn't support map A and E didn't support any of them. Um, so I don't know what, maybe they don't want any redistricting, I don't know. But I just want to make sure that, that that is known tomorrow when we go into this meeting. I know there was a, question about redlining last time, and I really don't think that was, was the case. I know where my children are going to school. I know there's been a lot of misperceptions, but we're excited to be going to Cockeysville, hopefully, with your guys' um, support. We're excited that that school is 60% minority, that it is 24% Hispanic, especially when you hear that 23% of Hispanic children don't graduate. I want my children in that type of environment. I grew up in that in Parkville. So I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow night. I look forward to you meeting our communities in the Central Northeast area, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ray Davis. Mr. Davis, good evening. Good evening. 
thank you. And uh, commendations to everyone here in the room. To the uh, young lady that spoke about special education, I'll, I'll say briefly that um, <clears throat> tonight, my 32-year-old Robert Davis, it's his birthday. He's 32, and my day starts off brushing his teeth, showering him, helping him get dressed, making his breakfast until his helper gets there. So for the young lady that spoke about making sure our special needs uh, children get the education that they need, it's existential for their survival because one day I won't be here for him. So let's move on to one of the reasons I'm here. I am the president of the Baltimore Citizens, Baltimore County League of Citizens. If you all could just stand quickly. Uh, I was again, as someone said, summoned here by our leader, Dr. Dean Scott. Please raise your hands. We have approximately 50 members. Most of them are retired principals, lawyers, military who dedicate their time to our school system, to our elderly, to our mentally handicapped, to our firemen and our police. Indeed, our last meeting was at a firehouse in Baltimore County. So let's move forward. A lot of people talked about fear. Fear is when you don't know. I know a little bit about fear because in the 60s, I went to Towson Elementary, which is within walking distance. And the parents, some of the parents, feared me as a five-year-old. Some of the parents took their children out of school because they feared me and my cousin Joe Carr, his mother, who lives within walking distance, two-mile walk. Ms. Doretha Carr, 93 year olds, was a principal for 57 years. She's um, a Towson resident. My grandparents, Amy and George Davis, live within two miles of here. They had eight children. They weren't allowed to go to school in Towson. It was against the law. Dr. Derek Bell, critical race theory. You all heard the term. You all didn't know he was the first African-American tenured law professor at Harvard. You know why he left? Because they would not hire a white female who was overly qualified. He left to, to bring Thank you, Mr. Davis. I will close by saying we fear the wrong things in America. We should be fearing mass shootings, not educators as brilliant as Dr. Yarborough, because Martin Luther King told us a long time ago, it is not the color of our skin, it is the content of our character. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker of the is Denise Rucker. Denise Rucker, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Benjamin Franklin said, an investment in knowledge pays the best dividends. Maria Montessori said that education, as even a small child, therefore, does not aim at preparing him for school, but for life. Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world. 
I'm here representing BCLC. My name is Denise Rucker. I'm here representing the Baltimore County Leaders and Citizens. I'm also representing my business, um, Eagle Drama Services. I am a certified recovery coach. I am certified in mentoring and education, and I am here to speak on youth advocacy and parent advocacy. Um, as we know, education is very important, and like I just quoted, it affects um, our children on many levels. I believe, um, as a woman who has been working in uh, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, in the public schools, in the public sector, I've worked in ju juvenile detention centers, I've seen that there is a lack of education in community. When I say community education, I mean conflict resolution, alternatives to violence, trauma recovery-based education. So. I created an organization called Eagle Drama Services that we support parents and we support students in the recovery of trauma and addiction recovery. So we're asking to partner with Dr. Yarbrough, thank you, uh, congratulations, and all of the new appointments, congratulations. We're looking for a partnership with the Baltimore County Public School System. Um, if we can come in during the day, if we can do after school programs, but we want to uh, kind of add this to the educational piece and curriculum. We have four curriculums for each topic. If you are interested, I can leave my we, information. We can't do a sales um, update at, as board comments. Okay, sure, so, okay. Um, but the point, the point I was making, is that there is a lot of um, trauma that has been unaddressed, um, a lot of um, educational trauma. We un understand that some of the population of Baltimore County, um, the students have been affected by their parents and who have been um, in active addiction. And so we want to help in those supports because that does affect the education of children. I have a quote that I say myself that uh, life affects education and education affects life. So we want to add those, um, just to add some things to the curriculum that you guys already offer. And I'll leave some information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is public comment on board policies. And we have several people who are speaking. Um, we'll start with board policy 0600. And the first speaker is Sharon Serhoff. I think I just spoke a little bit about discrimination. I'm going to elaborate on some of that because I myself have experienced it recently and in the past when my kids were in this school system and my clients have experienced it. If you were to look at me, I don't think that you would realize that I have a disability, but I have several and they are invisible. And one of the things that I have seen over my years in special education is how parents who have disabilities, invisible disabilities, are treated in the school system and in general by society. And our attitudes need to be addressed. So in looking at the discrimination policy that the board is looking into changing or tweaking, however you want to, rep however you want to put it, we must be mindful of the fact that we don't always see those disabilities. We can see the color of a person's skin. We can pretty much see how they are re with their religion and their ethnic background, but you can't always see a person's disability. And we have to be mindful of that because I have seen parents taken advantage of because they have a learning disability. And they make it known, or they don't make it known that needs to be mind that needs to be taken into consideration the other thing that needs to be taken into consideration is if i am a person in the community and a, and a parent brings me or wants to bring me to a meeting 
that that discrimination is going to happen to me as well if it exists. And I have experienced this year a lot of discrimination because I'm an advocate and because parents have decided that they need someone to speak their voice. And that's something that's not in there. Parents should be allowed to bring whoever they want to a meeting, whether it is a formal IEP meeting or an informal parent-teacher conference. And that should be in there. Thank you. Our next speaker on Policy 0600 is Dr. Farone. Good evening. Policy 600, page 3, line 21, says protective hairstyle includes braids, twists, and locks. I recommend that you add beard. Page number 4, line 18, 21. The superintendent shall, I love this one, Include a statement in student handbook, etc. I really like the word shell, and I encourage the PRC and the law office to use the word shall in policies more than the word will or may. On page four, line 28 29, a person who violates prohibition against retaliation shall be subjected, etc. Suggest that the word prohibition is plural. I think it's better grammar. And the same thing with the word discipline, it should be plural. I really like this policy for the word shall. It shows the determination. You know, discrimination has been for a long time in this country and affected so many colors and ethnicities and religions. And you, the school system, through policies, are the ones who would really correct that problem. I thank the law office and the PRC for this policy. Can I save my minute? Nope, sorry. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Our next speaker, um, is Derek Burnett. I'm not sure if he's here. The next speaker for Policy 0600, we got a lot of people, Dr. Fron, is Makita Scott. Good evening again. Evening again. Um, so for Policy 0600. My only suggestion, um, well, I thought it was good, uh, some of the additions that uh, were just spoken about, but it looked like it was missing a definition at the very beginning. I thought it should be of um, what discrimination is. I know it went into um, where it talked about uh, how not to discriminate against any person, but I think there needs to be a clear definition of what discrimination is because um, I hear discrimination being used for um, a broad array of things that aren't necessarily discriminatory. Um, it could be preference. So I think it needs to be clear so people know what discrimination is. And also, um, it looks like there's a definition down here from the, um, it looked like, for the student handbook. Oh no, there is not a definition. So I wanted to see if along with the definition of what discrimination is, if that definition could also be included in the student handbook so students can know um, what uh, discrimination is. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker on this policy is Helene Groves. Good evening. I think a lot of what I was going to say has been said, but good evening, Chair Lichter and members of the Board of Education. Thank you for your time. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to express my thanks for your dedication 
in developing a world-class education system that serves and values all students. Policy 0600, anti-discrimination, is aptly filed under the heading Basic Board Commitments. When I mentioned this policy to my fourth grader, because he likes to hear all the grown-up talk, he said, huh, that sounds like just being nice to everyone. I think it's a great idea. So kudos on that. Um, I do wholeheartedly agree with him. Uh, I also do um, second Ms. Scott's recommendation. Uh, I think it would be helpful to have a clarification, a definition um, preceding all of the examples. Uh, so in summary, thank you for valuing all students and stakeholders. While our commitment to equitable access is evident within our school system in the wide variety of curricular materials found within our classrooms and our libraries, and our community schools and media centers, approving and publishing a statement within our board policies and then following through with it sends a symbol to all of our stakeholders that symbols of students of all cultural and linguistic structures are not only welcomed, but valued and prized in our system. Thank you. Thank you. Our next policy is board policy 1100, um, and our first speaker is Ms. Seraf. I have read through this policy, and I think that you've heard me mention many, many times what needs to be addressed as far as communication is concerned. I was recently on a school website for a brand new client, and I can tell you that I couldn't find any administrator's name on that school website. We need to put in communication to the public exactly in detail what that's going to entail so that no one has to go on any website related to Baltimore County Public Schools and jump through hoops or dig around or dump down a rabbit hole or whatever you want to refer to it as to find the name of the principal to find the name of the special education department chair or IEP chair, or the advanced academics chair. I should be able to find that information easily on the first page of that school website. I should be able to find that information easily on the Baltimore County website. And I should not have to have access to Schoology if I want to find out my child's grades, I should be able to ask that question of their guidance counselor, can I have the report card please? Instead of also digging through the layers and layers. I have a goddaughter in the county and I can't get information on her because they don't want to give it to me. But they don't give it to the parent either. They send him emails, but he can't read those emails. He's blind. That's why he has me. You have to put in there very clearly what communication with the public means. And communication should be, I should be able to easily get the information that I need. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Frohn. Eleven hundred, right, Madam Chair? We're, yes, we're at eleven hundred. Correct? Yes. Communications with the public. Uh, good evening. Uh, the three minutes is not really enough for me to sing a praise about this policy. Thank you, PRC, law office. I love 7 to 11, committed to communicating, engaging, conducting outreach. I think it's wonderful. I loved line 13 to 17, 
engaging families and businesses. Remember, I talked about that in many of my presentations in the past. I loved line 22 to 24, providing the community opportunities for engagement with leadership. I loved line 26 to 30, further its goals, numerous challenges, numerous channels, system to citizenry of the county, and I have something to say about this, and the global community. I loved line 32 to 40, the superintendent will establish guidelines of strategic, etc., provided regular update. I am concerned about line 28 to 29. The citizenry of the county, and the other word is the global community. I am not really a citizen of Baltimore County. I am a citizen of the United States of America. I am a legal resident of the county. I don't know if it matters, but I throw it to you. Personally, I really don't understand the idea about going globally, using the word globally in this policy. I am not really against it, but I just don't get it. And I have been here a long time enough. If you can explain it, Madam Chair, or anyone, I would really appreciate it. The last concern I have that this policy does not really have teeth. Maybe there are teeth there, but I don't see them. If you have teeth to implement this policy, I really recommend that you would have a hot link that I can click on it, and it leads me immediately to what kind of teeth there would be if that policy is violated. Again, I really truly congratulate you for this policy. Thank, Thank you. you. Want me to go out or sit? You have to go back. There's more speakers. Our next speaker is Rosetta Butler. Ms. Butler. Our next speaker, I don't think he's here, Derek Burnett. Makita Scott, it's your turn. Hello, this is for policy 11? 11, 1100, yes. 100. Okay, communications with the public. I wanted to see if it could be specified more. It's on line 20 where it says, um, board supports numerous and varied channels of communication between the school system, the citizenry of the county, and the global community. Um, what I was see, looking for was to specify the channel of communication, like how that communication will take place. If you could put in there through email, phone, um, social media, web, um, community meetings, but specifying and uh, spelling out how that communications will um, happen with community members. Thank you. Thank you. Our next policy is 4100. Employee Conduct and Responsibilities, and the first speaker is Sharon Serhoff. I have a question for you. If an employee displays misconduct, how do we hold them accountable? If I'm a parent and somebody is verbally abusive to me, how do I hold that person accountable so it doesn't happen again? And I'm asking that question because several of my clients have experienced that this year. That they've sat in on a meeting and the only person who is tried to stop someone from verbally abusing them is me. And we still haven't figured out what course of action we can take to prevent that from happening again. And it continues to happen. I also think that we need to put into this policy 
an explanation of what that misconduct includes. Does it include bullying, intimidation, somebody just deciding I'm not going to work with that person? We need to know what the, is specifically employee misconduct and put some teeth in this particular policy because right now there isn't any. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Dr. Frone. I'm losing weight, Madam Chair. Back and forth. Yeah, Thank I know. You. Policy 4100. I really loved line 13 to 19, which talks, the board believes that every employee must act ethically, exhibit strong work ethics, work productivity, and perform their duties in a professional manner, standards of dress, personal appearance, general decorum, as well as moral standards and behavior. My concerns are, it may be better to place a hot link embedded immediately after each of those important words. Work ethic, what does it mean? Productivity, what does it mean? Professional manners, what does it mean? Standard of dress, etc. Placing them at the footnote is a little bit difficult for people who are not lawyers. And I really would not really feel the same. And I think in the footnote, there are references to US codes or maybe Maryland codes. And I understand fully why the law office would put references that are legal in nature. However, I am not really a lawyer, I am the public. And if you put a reference as a law, it's like you come into me for a medical consultation and I give you the textbook of surgery, Sabiston's textbook of surgery, in order to have the information. All right, you know, I can understand a little bit reading a law, but if you are not a lawyer, I think you need to have a language there that is more suitable for us, the public. Maybe both put codes, but put some simpler language, short one. Um, again, the policy is really great. Um, I enjoyed reading it, so thank you PRC, PRC chair, and all those who had input in there. I'm gonna let you stay there, don't move. Okay. Ne policy 5200, your comments for that one. Now this one is lengthy. May I take a little bit extra because the other gentleman. No. He, no. He, he took a minute. Keep talking, go, okay. go. You're right. losing time. Okay, I lost 10 seconds. You did. I really love the analysis in this policy. I read the analysis and I really love it. I think with you including most of public schools in the state of Maryland, their policies and putting some explanation to them is really great. I especially love the inclusion of that summary in each item. So I really thank you dearly for that. Line eight to 10, I love the word, Baltimore County Board is committed to ensuring that all students have opportunity successfully complete, etc. expectation. I liked line 15 to 27. There are important keywords here. Continuous development, level best suited for their achievement, really great. Normally progress annually from grade level to grade level. And then the judgment of the professional staff, I think that's really great. And the one that I truly liked is the educational interest of students. That you, the school system, the administrators, are at the end and the beginning, are putting the interest of the student as number one. 
So where is my concern here? I think the wording needs to be defined, just like what I complained with other ones. I think you need to define what continuous development is, best suited achievement is, normal progress. What does normal progress mean? Best interest, I understand it, but I think should be defined. And the criteria by which the principal will decide about keeping a child or not, I really think it should be known to us, the public. So what I recommend for you is really to con consider defining these important and key words and put a hot link so a parent like myself can click on it and completely understand what that means for my son or daughter. Last but not least, I ask the PRC to rely on objective data, data, data in their attendance, in the grades, in anything. And I thank you very much for you listening to me. Thank you. Get up. Get up, yes. Board policy, we're still on 5200, and Ms. Serhoff. I don't know if you remember, Ms. Lichter, that I mentioned this policy to you earlier this school year. I um, now do. Go ahead. I have spoken to many parents. I have clients who have experienced um, promotion retention. And I have myself experienced yelling and screaming about it with my own child. And parents feel left out of this particular process. First of all, a parent's voice concerning retention and, or promotion of their child is very vital because it's my child. And I live with that child 24-7 and I understand that child. And no, I don't think that my child is going to act differently in your school building than they are going to at home with regards to what they know and whether or not they're going to be able to be promoted to the next level. And a lot of parents feel that they do not have an input or a say in whether or not their child is retained or promoted to the next level. If I don't want my child promoted, doesn't matter, because my child will get promoted no matter what process they go through. And again, I can speak from experience with my own child, and I can speak from experience with many a client including this year, that parents aren't even told there's a process. I'm promoting your child, period, end of subject matter. That needs to be in the policy, what that process is, and it also needs to be shared with the parent if there's any question. And again, there needs to be teeth if there's not if it's not shared, what's that consequence? Because the consequence to the student by promoting them when they're not ready is lifelong in its impact. So you need to go back and really look at this policy. Thank you. You can also stay there and comment on 5250, promotion, retention, graduation requirements. Okay. With an extension to that, if my child has a certain amount of credits that they need, yes, students do attend school part-time. I have a couple of clients who are attending part-time currently. Yet I have also had clients who have been told that they can't do that. We have to take into consideration what the child's ability is, 
what the circumstances are before we say a blanket item that all children who didn't get, who didn't pass 10th grade English are going to repeat that in their senior year and they'll take 10th and then 12th grade or they'll take 11th and 12th grade English. I understand that they don't piggyback on each other. That doesn't mean that they can be taken in the same school year. And to be quite honest, you don't have to be, have a disability to have a problem taking those two English classes in the same school year. The other thing that needs to be very clear in this policy is that if a child is on home and hospital or special ed, that they get the same standards and the same requirements as their non-disabled or their non-whatever peers. And I can tell you that is not the case. That needs to be very, very explicitly clear in both of those for graduation and promotion and retention. Thank you. Dr. Ferrone, policy 5250. I liked line nine dedicated to ensuring graduate are college and career ready. I think this policy is impressive. The other words are high academic standards, that's great, rigorous, that is great, relevant curriculum, that is great, engaging, flexibility, etc. And then there is an important word in here, diverse needs, aptitudes, interests. We are a diverse county. And I heard all these words for the past 25 years. My question to you, why they are not yet fully implemented. So, I say to the staff, Dr. Yarborough and everybody, in policies, please do not blame COVID. COVID cannot defend itself. Line 10, 12 is also really great about employment, knowledge, attitude, potential as responsible, productive citizen. I like that word about productive citizen. However, I suggest to you to add law abiding citizen, not just citizen. I think our students need to know that they must, they should be law abiding citizens. So many of them carry guns and knives and do bad things and it does not seem to be getting better. It doesn't matter that it's not happening here or not as often, but there is so much of that stuff on the news and it's really bad. So I propose law abiding citizen and the school system needs to teach students to be law abiding citizens. Line 19, establish requirements for graduation in that, I think the public needs a hot link. What's the requirement for graduation? I don't have kids in school yet, but I'm reading the policy and I really wonder. Line 22, 23, you might be interested in that. It uses the word may. May establish graduation requirement beyond the minimum requirement. May establish graduation requirement. I think the word may is a little bit weak. It does not really show determination in it, may or may not, it is just really weak. And last but not least, please explain the Oxford comma. I really don't know. I read about it and I think it's controversial. Thank you, you can stay there for your last Comments on Board Policy 6306, Instruction, Schedules, Student Prayer, and Religious Literature Attendance. This policy is very important. Students have right 
line nine, to an academic environment where religious beliefs are not promoted in courses, etc. I am concerned about students have a right, the letter A, a right. I think it should be students have the right. I think a right is a weak one. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not trying to be a lawyer, but linguistically I think it's weak. Line 18 to 19, school opening exercise, United States government approved patriotic exercise, etc. My thought is the Board of Education should not really be shy about the flag or the Constitution or the national anthem. This is who we are. Millions of people risk their lives to come here for the liberty and the opportunities. We should not really be shy about mentioning the flag and the Constitution. I ask you to add them. Expressing religious beliefs, literature, wearing religious attire. I'm really concerned that this one is miniaturizing religion into literature. It just does not really sound right. You know, for the three religions, the holy book of each of the three religions is a scripture. And it is highly respected. I think if you use the word literature, you are kind of portraying an inferior kind of message. And they identified in the state of Maryland, that's line number 38, I believe. It took me more than 10 years with Dr. Barbara Desmond. God bless her. She came here a few weeks ago. And Muhammad Jamil to amend the policies of the Maryland State Department of Education in relation to this subject. MSDE is a minimum standard. This is Baltimore County. I have been fighting for equity, equality, among others, for a long time. It is minimum standard. We should be better. I think you should add more than that and not really just rely to abide by what they say. Line 4851, my time is finished. Thank you. And our next speaker for policy 6306 is Sharon Serhoff. That's okay. You can say pass. My concern with um, religious equity is um, somewhat of uh, Dr. Farone's, though we started out, I think, disagreeing way back when. Um, equity in religion means equity for everyone, whether I am wearing a hijab, um, and I do have friends who wear them, or whether I'm wearing uh, a uh, shetel, as uh, people in the Jewish religion refer to as their, I should say, Orthodox Jewish religion, um, refer to the wig that they wear on their heads. Um, and equality, and, and if I come into a school building wearing my religious attire, I should not be called out upon or told to go out um, or marginalized or felt marginalized in any way. And I think that that's happened, um, including recently, to both um, people of the Jewish faith, people of the Muslim faith, and people of other faiths in this county. So we need to tweak things. Okay. 
Thank you. And our last speaker for policy 6306 is Makita Scott. Thank you, 6306. Student prayer and religious literature attendance. And um, I just wanted to point out in D, where it says students are permitted to express their religion through voluntary prayer, reading, religious literature, and wearing religious attire. Uh, I think it should be spelled out what religious attire may look like, what qualifies as religious attire. Sometimes things that are cultural can be um, construed as religious attire. So I think like a, a maybe a spelling out, I'm sure there's something perhaps a precedence maybe that was at another um, in another system, but just spelling out what that looks like and what qualifies as religious attire. And that's on line 26 under D. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Muser. Okay. Madam Chair. Earlier tonight, the board met in closed session and took action on three cases, HE 23-16, HE 23-22, and consideration of a termination appeal. Now would be an appropriate time to confirm the actions taken on those three items. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's case HE 23-16 and 23-22 and the consideration of an appeal file filing? So moved, Hassan. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Savoy. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please don't forget to sign board members. Um, over on the table before you leave. The next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. This is the first reader for these policies, and for that I call on Ms. Christina Pumphrey, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Board Policy 0600, Basic Board Commitments, Anti-Discrimination, Board Policy 1100, Community Relations, Communications with the Public, Board Policy 4100, Personnel, Employee Conduct and Responsibilities, Board Policy 5200, Students, Promotion and Retention, Board Policy 5250, Students, Promotion and Retention, Graduation Requirements, and Board Policy 6306, Instruction, Schedules, Student Prayer and Religious Literature Attendance. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit H. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 0600, 1100, 4100, 5200, 5250, and 6306? Uh, Madam Chair, I, would, uh, I don't know if I need to make a motion, but I would like to pull out 0600 for, to review separately. Um, I just, no, you don't need to make a motion. So you want to pull out 6306? 0600. Oh, 0600. Okay, so let me s state this again. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 1100, 4100, 5200, 5250, and 6306? So moved, Harvey. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Ms. Dwyer, Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes, so I have um, discussion for several of them. So the first one is policy 060, 0600. The line for protective hairstyle. I don't feel like we need a qualifier in front of hairstyle. Could we just remove protective? We actually pulled that out for separate. I don't okay, know if we, so, we'll, so I think maybe we should wait for that we'll one. We'll wait for that one. Okay, so the communication policy, policy 1100. 11, so the policy as it reads, it feels it's one way, and there should be multi-directional communication among the superintendent and the community members. And there also needs to be defined metrics to assess the effectiveness of communication. And so we need, what are the analytics that'll be collected to know that we've actually 
communicated effectively with um, different constituents. And then for policy 4100, there, definitions are needed, I do agree, um, throughout the definitions. It's, it's unclear. Um, so for instance, what are the defined standards of behavior? Um, so we need to clarify. I recommend clarifying those definitions. And then in policy 5200, um, I, I had similar concerns around um, there's no, what are the rights of the parents in the promotion and retention of um, their child? And including some language about that in there. Thank you. Other discussion? Okay. So may I have a roll call vote on policies 1100, 4100, 5200, 5250, and? Uh, uh, can I move to amend these? Okay. Go ahead. What is okay, your so I move to amend policy, I pull up my notes, um, 1100, 4100, 5200. You said 1100, 4100, and 5200. Yes. To amend, how do you want them amended? And so for policy 1100 to define the metrics to assess the effectiveness of communication and to include multi-directional communication. So you have amendment, different amendments for each of the three. So we probably should take them one at a time. So you're moving to amend policy 1100, is that? Yes. To? To define the metrics to assess the effectiveness of communication and to include criteria for multi-directional communication. Yes. Ms. Madam Chair, I think we just want to highlight that's really a recommendation for the policy committee more so than an amendment of the actual lines in the policy that's being read tonight. So, so therefore. It's really an amendment to the motion that's before the board, more of a suggestion again to go back to the policy review committee and to consider those two changes you just mentioned. And so then before we vote to move it forward, it, they will amend, they'll make, the, they'll go back and consider it and bring back a revised version? If that is what you're asking that, for. That is what I'm asking what for. Ms. Grover, do we, are you talking to us? No. Oh, okay, okay. All right, so we, are we, so we're not making that motion to amend, but are we making a motion to postpone the vote until the? I, I, I believe she's making a motion to. To send it back to, to policy okay. Okay. committee. Okay. Officially known as committing it back to yes. the okay. committee. Okay. Just the one, or are we doing, if she's sitting? All of them. Right, so no, now so we're back to all three. Right. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Pumphrey. Do we need to vote on each one separately? If, if it's the same request for all three, do we need to vote on them separately? Well, you have five before you, correct? Correct, but Ms. Booker-Dwyer is focused on 1,100, 4,100, and 5,200, correct? Correct. So you want to send? A single motion to commit all three. So I make a motion <laughs> to commit all three, policy 1100, 4100, 5200, um, back to the policy committee for consideration of the language that, um, do you want me to read the language again? Does that need to be in the motion? Yes. Oh, okay. So I make a motion <laughs> to for um, policy 1100 to go back to, to the policy committee to consider language to define the metrics to assess the effectiveness of communication and to include criteria for multi-directional communication. In that motion, I also recommend that policy 4100 also goes back to the policy committee to define the standards of behavior. I also, in addition, I also recommend that policy 5200 go back to the policy committee to clearly define the rights of, that parents have in the promotion or retention of their child. Is there a second to Ms. Booker Dwyer's motion? Second, Dominowski. Thank you. Any discussion? May we have a roll call vote on Ms. Booker Dwyer's amendment? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? 
Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pomfrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. So the amendment um, carries. Thank you. Now, may I have a motion to accept the recommendation of Board Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 0600-5250 and six, you, know, you want to separate 50 to 50. Oh, OK. So may I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 5250 and 6306? Correct? No second is needed since the re those recommendations came from the committee. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? That's coming from the who wrote that? Who moved it? Oh, who moved it? So moved from Pong. Thank you. Oh, sorry. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. No discussion. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pomfrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? 5200 is what I sent back to the, we just, voted to send that back to the 5250 got it okay yes <laughs> miss lichter yes thank you okay motion carries now do you want to speak to while you pulled those 0600 yes i think it may be different um i w i intended on um moving to amend line 22l to add um beards under that description of protective hairstyles. But before I make that motion, I believe. Yes, I want to remove protected from, it's just the hairstyle. Where is that? So members of the board, the protective hairstyle definition comes directly from the state anti-discrimination law. Uh, the, uh, the reason that the policy as a whole is being recommended is because of changes to state law last year. And unfortunately, the, um, the state law did not give a whole lot of guidance. So there is a definition of protective hairstyles in state law. And this is a direct quote from state, the state anti-discrimination statute. So I, I hear that. I don't agree with it. And so what do we do about it? <laughs> I guess I have another question, if that's OK, or you want to answer that question. It's the board's pleasure. So members of the board, this is your policy. Uh, and PRC is used to me saying that. So it's what you want in your policy to guide the school system. If this is what you want, then you vote on it. If you want to change the language, I will do the research to determine whether or not that is something ultimately that is recommended. But it is your policy. So I recommend that we remove protective and just keep it hairstyle. and. I even recommend that we include wraps and headscarves. Man, man, so I am I'm going to recommend that we bring this policy back to the committee for reconsideration so that we can make sure that we are in line with state standards, that we're not uh, excluding uh, people inadvertently, and that we have our language and accountability correct. That, that would be my recommendation. So do we need an official motion to make? Yes, yes okay. there would have to be a motion to commit right. with direction to the committee as to exactly what you'd like the committee to consider. Okay. So I'm, I move that we send policy 0600 back to the PRC committee for review of the language regarding protected hairstyles and for potential inclusion of other factors as it relates to state law and board uh, recommendations. 
Second, Hassan. Any discussion? And can I just add to that? Also the definition of color, we define color with color. So could we revise that definition? <coughs> So do we need to restate the... Can I just ask a question, Ms. Howie, before we proceed regarding 0600? My question is just regarding those definitions, if, that ca if all of them came directly from state law. I think that's what you said, but I wanted to clarify. That is correct, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. So, Ms. Harvey, do you want to revise your motion based on... Go ahead, Ms. <laughs> so again, members of the board, um, obviously, again, it's your policy, and you guide us as to whether or not you want to expand uh, the uh, the scope of what is required or what is prohibited. Then that is the discuss. This is the place to have that discussion, and then staff will do the research to determine whether or not you do have that flexibility. So uh, the definitions are directly from the state anti-discrimination statute. I am creative, but I'm not that creative. <laughs> and so I don't feel like I need to amend my initial motion because that was uh, the state statutes and that uh, okay. comparison and review was a part of the motion. Okay, did we have a second on Ms. Harvey's? Okay, Ms. Hassan, okay. Any further discussion? Okay, roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frumpong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so we got all those policies taken care of, correct? Just want to double check. Okay, let me, oh, whoops. Okay. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call Mr. Hartlove and Mr. Dixit. Okay, good evening, sorry about that. Uh Good evening. Uh, we have three contracts for your uh, re uh, review and approval uh, uh, tonight. These are, we don't typically bring contracts to the second meeting of the month. The, uh, we did not have a buildings and contract tracks meeting for the for these three, but we do have staff on hand. Um, if you have any questions, the first one, um, we have uh, curriculum and instruction folks on hand and uh, for numbers, uh, exhibit number two and three, uh, my friend Mr. Diggs is here as well as his staff to, to answer any questions on, okay. on that. Let's take it one at a time. So um, do I have a motion, whoops, after each present, okay. Is there any questions concerning the first one, the elementary English language arts curriculum? Ms. Domenowski. Yes, uh, and without trying to get into contract authority, because we're going to talk about that yes. another time. Um, so this is a five-year, $10 million contract. I'm assuming there is a price tag on the actual curriculum. What is the price tag per year that we're signing with HMH for this curriculum? Um, and I will, I, would, I will ask some of the curriculum instruction folks to come forward, but I believe it. we're talking about a... Um, five-year contract, so I, I'm, my assumption is $2 million per year, but I want to ask for Hello. some support. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Um, actually, the initial purchase order will be for $10 million for the five years, so we get licenses for the digital mm -hmm. content, but the full purchase is made up front, and that purchase includes the, all the printed materials, so the teacher kits, the student books, all of the resources, um, access to digital content for the duration of the contract, as well as 220 professional learning coaching days and all of the getting started PD. So that actually is the initial purchase order. It's not an annual um, recurring cost broken down. 
So I'm just concerned. Why don't we put that in the contract, like the breakdown of what this $10 million is going towards as far as, you know, looking at a receipt and seeing what everything costs? Yeah, and I believe what we're doing here is, is, is we're paying it up front, but we're getting five years of, of, of support and, and a curriculum for that. So it's, that is, the, that is the, the, the full cost at that point. I understand that, but all we're seeing is 10 million. You're saying it, it, it goes, I, I understand it goes to a lot of things, but there's no breakdown of that as far as like, we're just seeing 10 million for this curriculum. There's no, you know, this much for the professional cost, this much for the kits, this much for blah, blah, blah. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I do. Um, so I can speak to one part of that. We certainly can provide the um, specific quote is exactly as I think what you're asking for. So we get a quote from the company that details everything you just described. Um, we can certainly share that. The other question you asked is about how the board exhibits is prepared, and I would have to defer to Mr. Hartlove because I don't do that part. Yes, and actually we do have a, a procurement uh, person here. Uh, he's our procurement manager, Rob Bertison, and uh, if you want to sit right here and you can speak to that uh, sure. question. Yes, ma'am, uh, could you pose your question again? Uh, I would just like to see what, Ms. Shea, I'm sorry, there's okay. so many doctors. I'm, okay, I'm not <laughs> a doctor, <Almost> <laughs> so. <laughs> um, I would like to, see in, in the contracts, instead of just seeing the contract authority the $10 million over five years, I would like to see what that $10 million is broken down to, exactly what is in that quote that we're paying for that amounts to $10 million. Okay, um, as in any of the board exhibits that you see, it's always the, the cost, what the contracted cost is or the approximate cost is gonna be. You don't normally see the breakdowns. Yes, they do have a specific proposal that lists all of the materials the costs of those materials, but in this particular instance, because it is broken down per year, per each individual part that is listed. So they have student digital licenses and all this different student digital licenses. It's actually quite a large list that would be there. We can make that available to the board, certainly. But in following the normal process of what you see for the uh, board exhibit, this is just how it's, how it's presented. Yes, I, I understand. I, I'm just looking at a $10 million price tag, and I think that's something that our public would like to see broken down. I'm certain. And we can provide that for you, yes. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Mr. McMillian. Hi. This is not my view, Mr. <laughs> McMillian. This is our second product. So we did a lengthy pilot of my view, was the first choice recommended by the stakeholder committee. Um, as you'll recall, we had some concerns raised and in being responsive to those concerns, we stood up a second pilot of a second product, which is HMH into reading. After doing both pilots, um, the feedback was pretty consistent from teachers and from administrators. Um, and we had some really powerful data from HMH of what they were able to see in terms of achievement in other districts across the country. And so we came back to the curriculum committee and we actually made the recommendation to move forward with HMH into reading. Okay, so we did my view for X number of months, two months or so last spring. Yes, sir. We piloted um, my view from last April through right now. I still have some teachers okay, using so we it. We had X number of schools do it last spring. Yes, sir. And then this fall, we, we expanded that my view. We did. And at the same time, we started this. In February. We started this in February of last year. This year. Okay, I'll get my years mixed up. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, last April, we started my view. We expanded it this year to a few additional grades and a few schools. Um, and then in response to some of the feedback that we were hearing throughout the first semester, we stood up a second pilot of HMH beginning this February. Um, we had 18 schools. I think it was over 200 teachers and thousands of students in that second pilot. Um, so then we had two concurrent pilots happening from February till current. Okay. But our recommendation after all of that is to bring forward the recommendation to go with HMH into reading. 
Okay, what kind of data do we have for my pilots? So we have um, different types of data. So from, uh, I'll speak to HMH since that's the contract that I'm here supporting. Um, first, we shared with the curriculum committee pilot implementation data. And what I mean by pilot implementation data is teacher surveys, um, classroom observations, and focus groups. So when you're implementing a pilot, we already know that we have third-party vendors like ed reports in different states that have told us the curriculum is aligned to standards and meets expectations because that's the requirement of state law. So what we were piloting was implementation. And those are things like how easy is it for teachers to plan? How well does it integrate into Schoology? How accessible are the resources to support our multilingual learners and our students receiving services for special education? We gather that data through qualitative surveys with teachers and administrators, as well as classroom visits and classroom observations and focus groups. That's the data that we brought forward to the curriculum committee. In addition, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, because we did HMH in a very limited setting, it's not reasonable to bring student achievement data that quickly. Um, if we could, that would be the magic beans in every district <laughs> would use it. But what we did was we asked our HMH partners to share with us data from school systems across the country that had used it for longer than that, for over a year. Um, those initial findings, one example was a study of close to 12,000 students in Texas. They had 22% increase in students meeting proficiency, as well as a 50% decrease in the students scoring two or more years below grade level. Uh, we also had data from another study that was kind of an aggregate of another 11,000 students um, in third grade where, I'm sorry, excuse me, um, 114,000 across grades two through five across all 50 states. And that data showed that the initial findings were 18% increase in students reading at or above grade level and a 44% decrease in students reading two or more grade levels. So between the qualitative pilot implementation data we had here in BCPS and the quantitative data that HMH was able to provide looking across the country, those were the two or really four data sources that we bring forward to support the recommendation. Okay, I'm not a researcher and I don't pretend to be a researcher. When you started the, this most recent one in February, yes. did you test the kids at that point in time? See, one of the challenges is that there are unit-based assessments built into a curriculum. What I can't do, it would be a false comparison, as any researcher would say, if I were to compare data from a different assessment in a different curriculum to data either in my view or we have several schools still in the BCPS legacy curriculum. Over time, what these data that HMH just shared, that's actually an external data source. So they use something equivalent to like our MAP scores or like your state assessment. That's really what you use to look at the difference. So yes, our students did take unit assessments as part of the pilot, but we can't compare those because it's a different test in a different uh, curriculum. So at some point in time, you can't retest them and then compare the two and see growth. What so. we're hoping, what we believe we're gonna see is when we have all students taking, you really look for the achievement to transfer to a third party assessment, whether that's our MAP growth assessment or our MCAP state assessment, because they're all aligned to the standards. And so what we'd be looking to see is, did this curriculum help our students meet proficiency as it's measured on those higher stakes assessments, either the growth and achievement in MAP or the MCAP state assessment? Thank you very much. You got it, sir, thank you. Other questions about the ELA? Ms. Frempong? So I have a question based on the last piece of what you said. Um, so we would expect to see proficiency, an increase in proficiency on this third party assessment. So if we don't, what type of support can we expect from HMH? That's a great question. So we actually had um, an initial, well, we've had multiple meetings in terms of professional learning. And so the contract includes um, over 200 days of professional learning that we can use um, across multiple years. And so what we actually talked about today was, of course, using a large part of that professional learning for the getting started. We have a very um, comprehensive plan of supporting our administrators, our reading specialists, and our teachers. But then we also will have days throughout the first year of 
implementation and the second year of implementation so that when we get data back, we're going to be having focus groups throughout the unit assessments, also using that map data. I should note um, another really important piece of data is that HMH has also acquired NWEA, which is the organization that does the map test. So what's super exciting is we're going to be able to map, map, sc <laughs> map scores, <laughs> I didn't even mean for that to be, um, we're going to be able to trace map scores directly to instructional resources and utilize that map data for being responsive to instruction in a way we haven't before. And then again, reserving some of those professional development days with those coaches for year two to respond to any um, anticipated changes or um, needing to address growth or lack of growth in any particular grade level. Sure. Other questions? Ms. Booker Dwyer. Hello, Michelle. Hi. I only have five questions for Okay. You. <laughs> so the first question is, what did the students say about the curriculum? So um, the students have given us really positive feedback about the curriculum. Um, part of it is that they um, actually preferred the stories. Um, so we did, I should also share, we had a Venn diagram of schools that did both. So we did have some schools that had piloted MyView and switched to HMH. And by far, the students said they preferred HMH stories. Some of that, both um, series made an intentional effort, although I will offer the publishing industry is still significantly behind in representation. Both represent an improved in our students seeing themselves represented in the literature, and the students talked about that. But one thing that they offered they liked better about HMH was that many of the stories were um, shorter, so they read multiple texts in one week. Some of the students did not enjoy some of the length <laughs> of some of the rigorous texts. Both are at the rigor of grade level, but HMH's approach was different. The other piece the students offered that they really liked were some of the reading workshop um, application activities, where they did more project-based um, writing activities. Um, we also got some really powerful feedback about they have a section around um, nonfiction text. A lot of our elementary students really like reading nonfiction. Um, Dr. Kraft, anything you want to add? Okay. <laughs> and you kind of hit on my second question sure. uh, around how are the demographics of our students reflected in the curriculum? Yeah, so that is a lot. And again, I want to preface this by saying um, the entire publishing industry is significantly behind. And there's many studies to show that there's progress, but still a lot to, to be um, improved upon. We actually did um, an audit ourselves. We use a culturally responsive curriculum scorecard published by NYU Steinhardt. You may be familiar with that. Um, and HMH actually represents a significant increase in representation, not only by race, but also by students with um, neurodiversities, students appearing in wheelchairs, but also having um, multiple perspectives so that we don't create a monolith narrative about um, how students or um, even gender roles or are reflected in the curriculum. And then how does this curriculum connect to the science of reading? Excellent question. So um, it is absolutely aligned to all of the principles of the science of reading. It is also approved, of course, through ed reports and six different states. Um, it talks about, um, it has specific, now we already have open court as our foundational skills curriculum, which is of course a part of that explicit and systematic instruction in phonemic awareness and phonics and fluency. But what HMH does is also pick up on the knowledge portion of the science of reading, which is sometimes left out of that conversation. And so they build knowledge through that integration with the content areas as well as those ongoing supports for those foundational skills. And then, I mean, that brings me to my last question. So how does this fit in with interventions and other things that are already happening in the class? How does that complement the continuum of instruction um, with some of the interventions and supporting resources for students? Sure, excellent question. Part of our effort is that we have far too many students needing intervention because we have not had a solid core. Um, what it all connects to is the standards. So the standards is the common thread. So what we're trying to help our teachers understand is that through um, some of the diagnostic resources within the curriculum, as well as those in open court, we can identify needs for students and plan responsive instruction with specific tier two and tier three interventions. This complements that well because because it, it also requires all students to have access to rigorous grade level text aligned to those standards. So we feel, of course, with a new year of implementation, we're going to have a lot of questions. So we're going to have teachers asking about the crosswalk between open court and um, HMH. We're going to have teachers asking about, hopefully, we should see less and less students being identified for intervention because we have that solid core and that significant investment in professional teachers. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? 
The data that you were mentioning uh, about the Texas, will that be made available to the board and the public to look at? I, I believe it was submitted as part of a response, so yes. So today you should have gotten some answers to some questions. I saw that. I, I, I have not gone all the way through it, but it does have like the graphs and the data. Back, okay. Yep. okay, I didn't get a chance to read the whole yes, thing. Yes, they are in there. And the last question is, um, as far as um, professional development, is there a schedule, is, there, is it mandatory for teachers to, to attend this? When does it start? Yes, so actually, <laughs> pending your vote in a few moments, we have a meeting tomorrow with administrators that we're hoping is our start. Um, we also have tentative plans on, on May 31st and June 1st to start with our reading specialists, um, and then there will be training for teachers. Um, we hope to begin as early as this summer. The challenge, of course, with professional learning in the summer is it's not mandatory. So our fail safe is the um, August professional study day will be absolutely mandatory. We do have the ability now in our registration system to track and monitor and we have already partnered with the Department of Schools about how they will help us. Um, we then have a comprehensive plan for repeating getting started training as we hire new teachers and onboard teachers throughout um, next year. Uh, we will have monthly professional development with reading specialists, staff development teachers, and administrators. Um, we're also forming a teacher leader corps. That's something that we've had in the past in Baltimore County, but it's critically important to leverage that teacher leadership role so that teachers can learn from each other that are in that experience. So so, um, and then we also have opportunities, as I mentioned, the integration with MAP um, aligned with our fall, winter, and spring administration. We'll have specific training on the data literacy of how to integrate uh, those recommendations from MAP to um, HMH. Thank you. I just have um, one question. So you had said that it was the 10 million initially, that it's not the two for over five years, but then what about things that need to be repurchased for year two, three, and four? Is that included in that first? So the consumables is included. So in terms of the predictable consumables, um, as always, you as you've seen in previous contracts, there may be an opportunity for us to come back if we have enrollment growth or we have anticipated opportunities and then we would come back for permission to increase that. But the predicted repeated spending over time is built into that. Okay, thank you. Mr. McMillian? You contributed a lot of time and energy to my view. What contributed to you making, drifting away from that? Mostly listening to our stakeholders. So what I wanna offer is my view is fantastic. My view is rigorous, it's aligned to the standards, but so are probably several others. But a curriculum is only as good as the implementation in the classroom. We know that our teachers, every research out there says the teachers are the most important factor in any classroom. Um, and so we uh, took that feedback to heart. Um, part of what was challenging around my view is it is extremely rigorous. And the feedback that we heard, especially from our new and non-tenured teachers, which we as a board know is often um, disproportionately occurring in some of our more challenging schools, it was challenging for them to plan and to address all of the components. So we heard that feedback loud and clear. Um, we don't believe we're sacrificing at all any rigor or excellence in the curriculum, but the feedback was clear that this one, in terms of implementation, was what we needed for our teachers right now. Sure. Ms. Pumphrey? I just quickly wanted to add that I know this is anecdotal, but um, I also just wanted to share that in, upon my visits to different schools, many of which were piloting both my view and into reading, there was overwhelming support by teachers for into reading, which was, um, I know it's anecdotal, but it was part of my questioning um, in the curriculum committee meetings as well as um, part of my decision to, um, uh, to vote, yes, in the, in the committee portion of the policy. Thank you. Any other comments? Does anybody have any questions about the other two contracts, the Chesapeake Terrace Elementary School Chiller Replacement or the Parkville High School Boiler Replacement? Ms. Dominowski. <laughs> Sorry, you know me and budgets. Um, so, okay, hi, um, enlighten me. What is the average cost for a chiller replacement? So every chiller is different. It depends on the size of chiller, which is a function of the size of the building. So smaller buildings have smaller chillers, larger buildings have larger chillers. So what you're looking here is an elementary school. When we come back to you for a high school or a middle school, it's going to be a lot more than that. So the good analogy is the window air conditioner, if you, if you can imagine. The more size, the bigger the size of the room, the larger the uh, air conditioner. So this chiller is a huge device 
which generates chilled water for the entire system. And how much chilled water we need, it depends on the size of the building. So this is just for chilling water? This is just for the, this is not, uh, this is the main equipment that chills the water, which is distributed to the entire building. And then there's sophisticated controls to maintain the temperature, water temperature that's needed. Okay, so this is another one where a, um, an itemized kind of receipt quote of cost would be helpful to the public because 1.5 million for a chiller, even in elementary school, it sounds like a lot of money. So uh, if it helps you, these things are designed by licensed professional, the whole system, and then it's bid in an open market. So that kind of manages the cost. The, the market decides the cost. I understand. I just would like to see an itemized quote of what we're paying for. For I, and I, I I get that part of it. I just Board want to members, see what each one. I would like to see what 1.5 million is actually paying for. Sure. Thank you for that. The the building and contract. We work in tandem with building and contract to develop what we present as an exhibit. So if there's discussion about tweaking this exhibit that's coming forward to the board. I would recommend a discussion in building and contract, so then I can weigh in, and then that we can present whatever you're looking for as we're presenting these contracts. Because I will just say, the design of what we present, presented, is based on the feedback and the, the, the template, template, if you will, what we've used with building and contract. So I'll just offer that. Um, I appreciate what you're saying, but again, we have spent some time developing that template so we can push forward the actual contract. But these three didn't go to Buildings and Contract Committee. I'm just saying, the okay. temp what you're asking for is really advising that we look at our template so we can have additional information. So that should be a conversation in Building and Contract. Okay, I'll send that to Buildings and Contracts. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions on those two? Ms. Frumpong? So my question is about the um, number of bids received. And again, maybe this goes to what Dr. Williams was saying as far as the template. Maybe there's additional information that's just not shown. But it, it says that 21, this RFP was issued to 21 vendors, but yet we only received two bids. So is that a typical process that we received such a low response? Or is it that this project is so small that maybe people didn't want to bid on it? So different contracts receive different number of bids. Mm -hmm. We do not control who's going to bid. Right. Our job done by his office is to send the material to different bidders, prospective bidders that are pre-qualified. When you'll see the new next contract, you'll see a lot more bids. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's for a boiler. That contract has six bids as compared to two bids for this contract. Every once in a while, we get a contract with only one bid. Fortunately, it doesn't happen too often. But a lot of times, you get seven, eight, nine, ten bids. So it's uh, who wants to bid, how much work is in the market, and how many bidders are hungry and they want job. That's the, what it amounts to. And just to, to add to what Mr. Dixit is saying, one of the issues we have right now with the with the very high inflation is if we were to say this may maybe we didn't get enough bidders we want to put this out again we're concerned that our costs would go up from there you know so it's we we want to strike while the iron's hot we feel like these are the best prices we're going to get in this environment so we feel we feel good that we've gotten some competition there and you know we feel like we've gotten the best price that we can get for quality Yes, I guess that's part of, I guess, why I ask about that, because I know that we um, we want to go with the lowest bid, but that's why I was looking at the number then of bids that we actually have available to us. And I believe we have a pretty uh, 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 tough quality control of who is considered a, a qualified bidder. So it's not just anybody. I couldn't just, you know, come up with an air conditioning company and, and, and you know, put a bid in. You have to really demonstrate that you can do the business, that you can do the work. Okay, thank you. Any last questions? Do I have a motion to approve items I-1 through I-3? So move, Booker DeWire. Thank you. May I have a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Any further discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Jaminowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. 
Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. you you're clapping for ELA, right? Or, <laughs> or for the chillers, which. <laughs> <laughs> All the above. Okay. Um, and thank you to the English Language Arts Office for everything they've done to um, bring that forward. Um, the next item on the agenda is the consideration of the Golden Ring Middle School program closure. I call on Dr. Yarbrough and Mr. Dixit. And while they're coming up, I'd like to also acknowledge that um, we did have the hearing last week or the week before, um, it's all running together. We had the hearing, um, and while we didn't have a lot of parents there, um, we did listen and really take into consideration the concerns the parents expressed about communication. So I really like to thank, if those parents are watching, for coming out and really talking to us about the um, ways that we could enhance and make communication stronger. Um, there weren't any comments surrounding closing Golden Ring, but it was the way that that information was relayed to the community. So I wanted to acknowledge the people that did take the time to come and that we, we do realize that we need to relook at the communication um, for that um, policy. But at this point, we're going to have your presentation on consideration of the program closure. Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening again, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Williams, members of the board. This time I'm joined by Mr. Pete Dixit and Melissa Appler from Facilities and Strategic Planning to bring forward to you consideration for Golden Ring Middle School program closure. I'll turn it over to Mr. Dixit. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough, and congratulations on your selection. <laughs> thank you. Um, the board uh, public hearing for the Golden Ring Middle School closure was held on May 3rd. Uh, at Eastern Technical High School, which most of you attended. Uh, I was in there, meeting was facilitated by Mr. Paul Taylor, who's our Director of Strategic Planning and part of my team. There was, as you notice, sparse public attendance. Uh, only three speakers uh, uh, voiced the, their opinion. None of the speaker objected to the closure. Two sp speakers did voice their concern about the communication of the closure. And it is the same thing that you had expressed in the last meeting. While communication complied with the policy and rule 7610, we do agree that there is always room for improvement and our team will be working hard to make sure that in future we apply additional means of communication and we had a lot of internal uh, conversation on that. One of the speaker advocated for maintaining aspects of the facility for use by recreation and park. And as we shared with you before, uh, the repurposing of the building and grounds has not been finalized. It will be discussed and shared with you. And we'll surely keep that in our mind. And we'll start conversation with Rec and Park uh, and superintendent's team. So with that, uh, we are asking for your approval of the closure of the Golden Ring Middle School program. So may I have a motion to approve the proposed Golden Ring Middle Golden Ring Middle School program closure? So move, Pumphrey. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Harvey. Thank you. Any discussion? Mr. McMillian. Mr. Pete, you know that I'm not real happy with the process. However, I'm extremely happy that I heard you just say there's room for improvement. We always say that, absolutely. All, so you, do you mean it? <laughs> absolutely. We're going to do it. You're always <laughs> saying it. I don't know that kind of thing. So we have a history of working together. Whenever you have pointed out something, we have always tried to improve upon it. Thank you very much. Yes. And if you. I may just add, we haven't closed the school in a long time. Yeah. So, so as Mr. Dixit said, we heard the feedback and we understand about continuous improvement. We're all educators, that's what we do. So when we heard that, we knew that communication, and I will just remind this board, there was conversation prior to my arrival by Golden Ring. If you go back in time, Mr. McMillian, and look at some of those tapes, there were, well, maybe it wasn't a tape, but at least there was some discussion. 
and there was a lot of things happening during that time. Hybrid board coming in, new superintendent coming in, strategic plan being developed. So we take that feedback seriously and we heard the board and our constituents loud and clear about process improvement and better communication. And that's what we have been charged to do and I know we will continue to improve in that direction. Any further, Ms. Booker Dwyer? And so I'm all for closing the school, but I am still concerned about the order. I hate to close a school and then not be able to tell students, this is where you're going to go to school. You know, we don't know the boundary. The boundary studies are still being done. And just recognizing that some students, especially um, students with certain lear different learning abilities, may need a longer on-ramp to prepare for to go to middle school. And so I'm proposing that we delay the vote until we know the boundaries, till we know, so we can definitively tell the students, okay, we're closing a school, and this is the school where you're going to go. To close a school and not to have a clear path forward for where those students are, where some students are going to enroll is a bit concerning to me, especially for students who may have some anxiety about going into middle school. Um, and, so, and so I'm proposing, I make a motion um, to delay the you're, vote. You're amending. I, I'm amending the motion. I'm amending the motion to delay the vote until. Four. We, we can definitively say where the students are going to go to school until the boundary study, until we vote on the boundaries. Yep, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Booker Dwyer, I just confirmed with um, uh, Mr. Dixit that no one will move to another school before 2024. And so if we have this vote this evening, and um, as you know, we're scheduled to have the vote of the boundary study uh, within a few meetings there still will be more than a year's notice that we can give to all of our families in terms of what school they're reassigned to. Just wanted to make sure that I shared that information. That, that's helpful. And I, and I am, I'm just thinking of, because I know I have a kid who, it takes a long time for, it takes a two year transition process. Yeah. And so I'm just thinking of the impact that it can have on some students who need that longer on-ramp, who may need two or three years in order to get their mind right to transition to a school. And, it, and it's a process for parents. You go to the building, you, walk, you get the child comfortable with it. And so that's my only concern. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. I think we can pledge to get that information out as soon as possible, but the passing of this vote allows members of the team to have different conversations to make sure that there's, you know, minimal gap, if any, in terms of how we're repurposing the building. And also adding to that, all of the students from Golden Ring, and Ms. Appler, please confirm, they will all go to the new middle school. It is state-of-the-art facilities. In all of this conversation, uh, that point has been lost. So I want to remind all the board members, it's going to be an outstanding middle school, uh, one of the best in the state. And so will all the feeder middle schools go to Northeast? So that all the schools that feed into Golden Ring right now, can we definitively say that they will go to the new school? No, that part, Ms. Appler, you'll have to help me with that. Thank you. Well, the elementary um, I will have to get back. To you on that one. Yeah. Right. And oh, that's my concern. Yeah. Th that, that that's one. the root of my concern. We need to be able to definitively say where are all those elementary school students are, and we know they're going to go somewhere. But to it, I, it just it doesn't sit right. It's not. It doesn't sit well with me to close a school and not to have a definitive to tell a student, and this is where you're going to go next year. We've closed your school, but don't worry, we got you. You're going to go to Perry Hall, or you're going to go to the new school, or you're going to go. I just feel like the order is off. To reiterate what um, Dr. Yarbrough said, the longer implementation period, um, having over a year, actually gives students, we will be able to communicate with them numerous times about where they're going to their schools. We'll be able to have better coordination with the elementary schools about preparing those students in that, that transition time um, because we will have over a whole school year. It also gives parents an opportunity to explore magnet if they choose to explore the magnet application process in November before um, students actually move. So it gives them a little bit more opportunities as well. Thank you. When is the vote on the new North, on the new Northeast boundaries? I know the hearing's tomorrow, but I've- June 13th. Uh, so our next board meeting is the vote on the boundaries, okay. Um, Ms. Domenowski. Sorry, I, I, I could be wrong. I was under the understand, 
would if we don't vote on the closing of Golden Ring, will it delay the vote for the Northeast Boundary study, like the survey? Well, they're two separate. I know they're two separate things, but that survey is contingent on closing Golden Ring, correct? What survey are you referring to? The the Central and Northeast yeah, Bound. Saying part of that, part of that study that. includes the whole school going there. Yeah. I, I was under that impression also. I also just based on my IPS and funding and all sorts of, I think that was the reasoning behind voting on the closure first. Yeah. Okay, so Ms. Booker Dwyer, are you making a motion? Are you amending the motion? So is one thing, could we do them both at the same time or is one thing dependent on another? I think that's what we're trying to. Right, so you're making a motion to postpone. I made the motion to approve the proposed closure. You're making a motion to postponing. You're amending to, mo to, to po not amending. You're, you're pro postponing the vote. Postponing the vote to the June meeting. Okay. When but now, we vote right. on the boundary. Okay, so we would vote on that before we vote on the first piece, correct? Well, you, vote on the you, have a mo you have a motion pending on the closure if you have a majority that supports okay. that I now. Okay, so we'll go back to may I have a motion? I had that, I had the second, this was the discussion. May I have a roll call vote, please? Yes, may I have a motion? I may, we are voting on approving the proposed Golden Ring Middle, Sc Golden Ring Middle School program closure. Okay. Now roll call vote, please. Oh, if I voted to, if I requested to move the vote, do we vote on that first? That's what I thought, but you're saying. I know, Madam Chair, I just, if, if there's a second for her motion. Oh, okay. So Ms. Booker Dwyer's motion is to postpone the vote on the closure. Is there a second for her motion to postpone the vote? Okay, there is no second, so that fails. Now we're back to the vote on the motion to approve the proposed Golden Ring Middle School program closure. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempal? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mrs. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Abstain. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favor is Nine. So the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, staff. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on the 2022-2023 third quarter results. And for that, I call on Dr. McComas and Dr. Mullinex. So good evening. Good, good evening. Um, Chair Lecter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, members of the board, I'm Dr. McComas, the Chief Academic Officer, and I'm joined this evening by Dr. Molinex, our Acting Chief of Schools. We're here to provide you a third quarter data monitoring report, uh, and in light of the time this evening, we will move quickly through a few of the slides. Next slide, please. Good evening. As always, we start with our compass. The compass gives us the um, helps us guides us to increase student achievement for all students while preparing a variety of pathways to prepare students for college and career. Our commitment to ensuring that every school is preparing students for careers and college is evident in our four key initiatives: teaching and learning framework, new curricula in elementary English and language arts and mathematics. English for speakers of other languages, advanced academics and gifted and talented, and special education programming and supports. And lastly, disciplinary literacy. The two focus areas of the compass we will discuss this evening are learning accountability and results, along with uh, safe and supportive environments. More specifically, we will look at attendance, student belonging, and course performance. Next slide, please. So in this first slide, I'd just like to highlight, uh, we did see an increase in attendance overall. Um, and again, we'd like to move quickly, so if you could go to the next slide. We want to take a moment here to focus on chronic absenteeism, as we know that we were all greatly concerned uh, at the end of second quarter. We're pleased to 
to share that 11.1% decrease in chronic absenteeism comparing third marking period to second marking period. And specifically, we had 16% decrease in our elementary school chronic absenteeism. Um, our pupil personnel workers have worked collaboratively with schools to decrease the chronic absenteeism in schools and are doing the following things to to urgently address attendance. PPWs work with each school's attendance committee to identify students who are chronically absent and to intervene. Hereford Middle School, Woodbridge Elementary School, Chatsworth School, Hereford Middle School, um, and Carver Center decrease their chronic absenteeism rate and demonstrated wonderful examples of the collaborative work that is done between schools and central office to attack the chronic absenteeism we are seeing in our schools. Schools implement tier one strategies such as people pupil personnel worker working with schools to bring awareness to the benefits of school attendance and also support recognizing and incentivizing students. At the tier two level, PPWs work with groups of secondary students to stress the importance of regular attendance. They provide students with letters to take home that list resources for families. At the tier three level, interventions for chronically absent students include making home visits, referring to project attend, and sending home state's attorney's letters. Next slide, please. Uh, just here, very quickly, like to highlight that we also saw a decrease in chronic absenteeism in our VLP program. Next slide, please. As evident in our suspension data, our schools continue to reinforce high behavioral expectations and to address misconduct where appropriate. Schools provide proactive, responsive, and logical consequences for students. As we continue to progress during our first year of face-to-face, -face, I'm sorry, second year of face-to-face -face learning, schools have been responsive to the needs of students while we're establishing clear and consistent expectations for student behavior. This time of year, schools are actively revisiting the student code of conduct and expectations for behaviors and address behaviors that are not productive. Next slide, please. The elementary and middle school course grades for ELA, math, science, and social studies are displayed when, um, when the percentage of seeds are students earning a C or higher. Overall, our elementary and middle school course grades show stability over the first three marking periods, reflective of our return to a more normalized school year. At the elementary level, grade level teams meet regularly to review curriculum-based assessments to adjust instruction to ensure they are being responsive to student needs. Schools like Sandalwood Elementary, uh, Shady Spring Elementary, who saw increases in the number of students scoring C or better, are committed to the professional learning communities in their building and providing ongoing job embedded professional development to discuss various strategies that have impact on student achievement. Schools are consistently focused on unpacking standards to ensure the level of rigor is consistent with the grade level expectations. Next. Next, Next slide, slide, please. please. Uh, the high school course grade distribution chart and a percentage of students earning grades C or better are also displayed for all three marking periods. Overall, again, we see relative stability in course performance across the three marking periods for students in grades 9 to 12. Integrating bias and viewing instruction and opportunity through an equity lens has been a significant part of our ongoing work. Schools like Western Tech and our Central, Northwest, and Northeast EDLP programs have seen increases in the number of students scoring C or higher are focused on opportunity, access, and high quality instruction. Ongoing graduation monitoring is provide timely support to academic success as well as long-term planning so students are in courses that open doors for success in college and career is essential to ensure students are college and career ready. Next slide, please. So the next two slides um, are course grades for VLP elementary, middle, and high school. If you could go to the next slide and the next slide. As we move through the fourth quarter, regular attendance must continue to be a focus because in order for students to benefit from the high quality instruction our teachers are providing, they must be in school regularly. We want to encourage families to continue being diligent and sending their children to school every day and every, uh, we are capitalizing on every moment we have our students. Schools will continue to nourish the positive client school climates that foster a sense of community by creating welcoming environments for families and will continue communicating with families regularly and providing necessary resources to assist in regular attendance. Our Department of Schools Executive Directors will continue to work with school leaders to develop strategies to engage hard to reach parents to help support them to maintain student attendance. A positive school culture and climate is necessary for all students to thrive and engage in the educational process. 
so they might, can flourish academically, socially, and emotionally. It is also important to recognize that these climates build teacher morale and provide our staff the support needed to finish the year strong. In accordance with requirements of the federal um, Every Student Succeeds Act, the establishment of a positive school culture and climate supports the building of positive relationships, high expectations, and effective instructional engagement, and utilizes inclusive practices so all students succeed. Fourth quarter is an opportune time for schools and communities to come together to celebrate the successes of our students, staffs, and families. High quality first instruction is essential to student success. Course grades are based on the student's level of performance in relation to what the course expectations and standards are and what students are able to demonstrate. To that end, teachers are continuing to collect multiple pieces of evidence to be sure students are demonstrating a firm understanding of course expectations and standards before determining a final marking period grade. As students complete assignments, descriptive feedback that communicates where the student is in relation to learning goals and what the student's needs to do to next to reach the goal is provided. Students can, can, should continue being given multiple opportunities to demonstrate what they know in a variety of formats. Next slide, please. May I do this? Uh, BC, BCPS offers K through 12 programs for support student, to support sp student learning over the summer. Each summer we serve thousands of students through our summer learning opportunities. Last summer we served 23,000 students. We stand up a four week so school system larger than half of the LEA's total student population for perspective. These programs are designed with specific student groups and learning needs. We continue to expand our summer opportunities each year. More specifically, the ESOL office offers summer programming for our English learners with an in entering or beginning of English proficiency. The middle school program will focus on English language development, study skills, and career and college readiness. The high school program for students entering grades 9 through 12 offers participants the opportunity to earn course credit to satisfy a graduation requirement and to participate in soccer or art. Identified students with disabilities receive ESY services as determined by the IEP. ESY focuses on the maintenance of critical life skills as well as academic and functional goals, objectives that identify on the IEP. Special education teachers and related service providers provide specialized instruction and services during ESY. Extended, learning, uh, extended year learning for secondary students. In the high school, EYLP offers students the opportunity to work towards recovery or advancement of, of credits for graduation. Students participate in learning experiences, including teacher-directed instruction and independent online work. The middle school EYLP addresses students needing reading and or math support. The program consists of blocks of instruction dedicated to English language arts, mathematics, science, technology, engineering, and the arts. New this year, expanding EYLP program to two evening sites, Parkville and Woodlawn. Alternative schools will have summer programs. Virtual touring in the evenings during summer programs and each school is receiving up to 16 hours a week of virtual tutoring. Each elementary school uses data unique to its learners to, in order to build a summer program that meets the needs of their students. Therefore, summer program offerings will differ from school to school at the elementary Additionally, we are offering two specialized math opportunities aligned with our strategic plan and system improvement teamwork. Math Pioneers is for sixth and seventh graders to support readiness and success in Algebra One in eighth grade. Our fifth quarter opportunity designed for students who took Algebra One in this school year and earned two E's or two D's demonstrating the need for extended learning time to master the standards of Algebra One. This slide lists the programs that are available this upcoming summer. A program description and contact information can be found on the BCPS Summer Programs website for each of the summer opportunities listed on the slide. The Summer program site can be accessed through a link on the BCPS homepage. Families who are interested in determining if their child qualifies for a program can contact the program coordinator listed on the website. Next slide, please. And as always, we conclude with the schedule of upcoming reports. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to ask one question. You said 16 hours of virtual learning. That was part of the high school? Virtual tutoring. Virtual tutoring. Because that, can you um, explain that just a little bit? Because that's a new piece that I think is important for people to hear. 
Yeah, I can explain that. Um, and that is um, available for the high school um, and middle school. So what we found is students that were in the program during the day um, needed additional time. Um, and this allows the teachers to work with the program administrator to follow up and provide that extra attention to students at a later point. So it's not just constrained to the, the time that students are physically present in the program. And how will they, ac oh, sorry. How will they access that additional um, virtual support? So it would be through a Google um, virtual meeting. Like a sign up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Other questions about the presentation from any board members? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on the Education Foundation of Baltimore County. And for that, I call on Ms. Deborah Phelps and Dr. Heather Woolrich. Thank you, ladies. I know we're behind time. Time? We, we're past your time to start, so yeah. thank you for waiting. Thank you for having us. So we would like everyone to stop and just reflect and to imagine, okay? We ask our kids each and every day in the schoolhouse to be imaginary thinkers, to be problem solvers, but tonight we want you to imagine these three scenarios. You've completed your intern student teaching experience in Baltimore County, and you love the two schools in which you gained so much knowledge. Receiving an advanced contract from the system, you began scoping out schools that you wanted to call your new home. Interviews occurred, and then you received notification that you were being offered a position in what you say is your dream school. You're super excited about becoming a teacher. Now that you have an assignment, you are ready to start planning. Receiving an invitation to stop by your school to take a peek at your room, you walk into the office and there is your principal, greeting you with a hello, a warm welcome, and a high five and a big hug. To you, this is perfection with a capital P. The moment you arrived, then you walked down the hallway into your classroom. Your heart is beating with excitement as you open the door to walk inside. You look around and your mind starts spinning with ideas. You can visualize your students sitting in the seats. You can see the colorful bulletin boards on the wall and you can see the rug on the floor. There were there some, 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 some supplies left in the desk and a student selection of books on the bookshelf left by the teacher before you. But this room needed so much more. And I was so excited, and you were so excited to make it happen. What do you do? Maybe make a list of items that you need, make an item, a list of items that you wanted, but that takes money. Turning around with tears in your eyes, a fellow teacher is standing watching behind you. Feel with slight embarrassment as those tears are running down your cheeks, you say to her, I might have to find a part-time job because I want to make sure this classroom is a warm, inviting learning environment for my children, and I need so many things. And then the fellow teacher says, no, you don't have to get a part-time job in Baltimore County Public Schools. We have two educator resource centers called the Exchangery, Gizmos and Gadgets Galore. These are centers where educators can shop monthly at no cost for supplies and resources for your classroom and for your students. Wiping the tears away, it was time for yet a second high five, a big hug, and a sigh of relief. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of several opportunities the foundation provides to our educators in Baltimore County. And now please imagine that you are a teacher like me on a middle school eighth grade English team. You join a coffee meeting at the end of the school year because you and your teammates want to start planning for the very next school year, even before this school year has ended. So many ideas are listed on the wall chart that will make an academic and social emotional impact on your baby students. These ideas need to be strategically prioritized, and it hits the team. If we really want to implement these innovative ideas, we have to have funding. The door opens and walks in your, your assistant principal. You are so excited to share your ideas, but you're hesitant because you're not sure funding is available. Your assistant principal says, don't worry, Baltimore County Public Schools has you covered. We have an education foundation that provides 21st century innovative, innovative grants for you 
Take time right now. Check out their website. The applications have opened, and they are ready to hear what you propose. And they will provide you with the funding necessary to provide your students with these innovative pr priorities and programs. That, ladies and gentlemen, is another benefit of having this education foundation as your nonprofit. And the last scenario we would like to share is as follows. You are a 2023 graduate who has submitted applications to attend several HBCUs. Scholarship money has been earned, so you're okay there, but, you're, but you are gonna be attending Howard University in the fall, but need just a little bit of extra money to be able to buy books and resources. You've been working really hard, you've been saving money, but a little extra would help with all the books I have to buy. You speak to your counselor who directs you to, to Naviance to submit an application for an HBCU book scholarship. You see, ladies and gentlemen, just another opportunity provided to our students in Baltimore County Public Schools to further their education in colleges and universities. We are the Education Foundation, and we are proud to be able to support the students and ed educators in Baltimore County and all of 177 schools. You have in front of you our PowerPoint and our executive summary. I'd like to just share a little information before we, we part from this table this evening. Due to our time together on behalf of the Foundation, Board of Directors, and our Executive Leadership Committee, we would like to present to you contributing to a brighter future, where we feel that collaboration enhances relationships, collaboration within the Foundation, the this, this school, system, and the community. Please advance the slide. You see, there is some historical perspective of the foundation as we're 30 years young. We celebrate our 30th anniversary this past year. And when I came in as the executive director, the first one, it was very interesting because I would say that we were in the infancy stage. <laughs> Uh, we were just crawling around and trying to make sure that we were supporting this district in every way we possibly could. But I would say now proudly, as we look at the foundation, we are in at least pre-K or kindergarten <laughs> as we are advancing our education for our students and for our teachers in Baltimore County. Our core values as we take a look forward. Please okay. advance the slide. These are our core values of what we believe. We are strong ambassadors for Baltimore County Public Schools. Our feet on the street and our conversations that we have with our community is very strong and very vivid. We are among the preeminent charities for advancement of education in our community. People know who we are because we have increased our awareness over the past several years. And we believe that all BCPS students deserve equitable access to a world-class education. And we are eth we exhibit professionalism and compassion for in all of our endeavors. Please advance the slide. You see our statement of purpose? Three things. Students, schools, educators. Students, all students. Educators, all educators. Schools, all schools. Making sure that we build and provide resources to serve all of them and provide under federal and state laws an appropriate method to solicit charitable donations. Our mission, please advance the slide, to support educational outcomes. Our vision, please advance the slide, to have resources needed for success. And our goals are very simple, fundraising, programs, and advocacy. As we advance the slide, let's take a look, please, at our fundraising. Who wants to play ball with us on Saturday? I have to give a shout out, Dr. Williams, to Chair Lichter, Dr. Mullinex, Mary McComas, Dr. Mary McComas, Christina, and other board members who are with us, because our event that we raised money for on Saturday was amazingly, soakingly, amazingly beautiful. <laughs> you can say we swam through the event. <laughs> but the whole thing about it was it was fun, it was exciting, and it brought camaraderie. Our, our allied sports kids came together, 13 middle schools, 111 athletes, and was playing just their hearts out in the gymnasium, filled with cheerleaders and mascots and families and and just just loving what they were doing led by Mike Bordick and Rick Dempsey. The Patasco band led us down to the to the uh, softball diamond. We had a home run derby and it was just hitting balls out of the park <laughs> as our our celebrities and pro athletes came together to be able to raise money for our schools and our students. And then come the home run derby after that we had the softball game between the administrators and teachers. And I hate to say it, guys, <laughs> second year in a row, 
that trophy was hoisted by our administrators. <laughs> this is what we do, ladies and gentlemen. We do this to support our grant programs, our scholarship programs, and the exchange rate. If we could take a look, we would like to invite each one of you to do a site visit at the exchangery, Gizmos and Gadgets Galore. If you look in your packet, you will find schematics of both locations that just are just oozing with supplies and resources for our teachers. It's like a kid walking into a candy, a candy store or a woman walking into Nordstrom's to buy shoes. <laughs> That's how excited our teachers are when they come to the exchangery to be able to shop the shelves for their students. Our data tells our story. Our data shows increased growth. Our data shows increased awareness. We want to make sure that we are the number one foundation in the nation for any public schools that, any public school that we have. So I ask you, as as we turn to the final page of the PowerPoint, be a storyteller, be an ambassador, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, join us on LinkedIn. We, we guarantee you, if you go to any of those social media platforms or our website, you are going to find the joy and happiness that the foundation brings our students, our educators, and our schools. We thank you very much for this opportunity to join you in an abbreviated version of who we are and what we do. Take a look at our numbers, because following that, you will find our annual report that will be coming shortly and our impact document as we continually grow for this school district. Are there any questions, ladies and gentlemen? So on behalf of all of us, I just want to thank you for everything that you do. I mean, what you described as far as giving materials to our teachers, um, the, the, the grants that you give to schools to take their ideas and make them come to, um, to fruition, and then also just the, the fun activity. So yes, sat Saturday was a very rainy day, <laughs> um, but um, especially the morning when the kids were in the gym and competing, it was um, such a worthwhile event. So thank you for all your hard work and everything that you do to support our um, system. You're more than welcome. We're about building, building partnerships for the district, but the big thing about it is this. We swam through Saturday. We ask you to dive into the executive summary and find out more about us. <laughs> and, Thank you very and much, we ladies will. and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McMillian, go ahead. And you were there, too, on Saturday. Yeah, Thank you. I just wanted to say I love the scenarios. And that's a reflection of you guys being teachers. And everything you do, you do top shelf, top notch, and, and first class. So thank you very much for everything you do. Thank you. That's the kind of school system that we have here in Baltimore County, and we are proud to be able to serve in that capacity. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Cool. The next item on the agenda is informational items, including the revised superintendent's rules, 3128, 3170, and 5230, board policy 8341, um, appeal before hearing examiner. Oops. Um, the revised 23-24 school calendar reflecting the change in the primary election day and the financial report for the month ending March 2023, the quarter three audit report and update on key school legislation. Next, wait a second, I just gotta scroll through all this. Okay, the next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda, agenda setting. So first is committee updates. Um, the links to the May committee meetings to date can be found on board docs under this agenda item. So for committee updates, I'm um, starting with the audit committee, Mr. McMillian. I have some bullet points. Okay. And I, I'll try and I read fast, that's just the way it is. At its April 11, 2023 audit committee meeting, the committee received a brief overview from the risk manager related to the focus of risk management and its relationship to risk assessment. The CFO presented information related to the terms of the contract with the board's current external auditors, Clifton, Larson, and Allen, to determine how soon any action may be required to be taken related to the external audit function. The chief auditor presented the Office of Internal Audit Quarter 3 update that provided information about audit activities from July 1st to 2022 through March 31st, 2023. And these were 
Audit activities completed. Purchasing ESOL SRO third party billing SMOB certification. Audit activities in process. Special education dispute, dispute resolution. Office of Health Services. Barriers to learning. MSDE certification and salary review. Maintenance of student data. Applications and reporting and review of potential overpayments to all union and not represented groups. Audit activities in the reporting phase. Student enrollment and shared domicile I IT security, audit activities deferred, retention, hiring, recruitment, audit, ADA claims process, bus route, safety, school safety measuring, measure programs, audit activities planned but not started, CTE accreditation, bus contractor management, investigations, 87 con cases were received as of March 31st, 2023, 23 investigated by internal audit, 7 referred out to management for investigation, 57 were closed with a memo to file. Reminder that all audit reports issued as of March 31st, 2023 have been posted to the Office of Internal Audit web page. Additionally, the Office of Internal Audit completed projects are discussed at each audit committee meeting throughout the year due to potential personnel matters, investigation reports are not posted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Ms. Demonowski, Budget Committee. Uh, yes, on May 11th, we met and talked to Dr. McComas, Ms. Mache, and Ms. Meyer was there to talk about the ESOL programs and the special education programs. Um, and Dr. Mr. Hartlove killed our dream of <laughs> needing more money in those departments. Um, but. Um, in our next meeting, we're going to talk about um, contract authority, and I'm I'm wondering if we can kind of merge the two. It was a good conversation as far as how we come up with how much we per student, how many students we're going to have, and what we're going to need money-wise as far as serving those students in the ESOL and in the special education department. I think this goes across the board as far as how we. Um, determine our enrollments. I know we have a you know we have to do it by a September 30th date. And I, 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 w I think this is a good, if we can have a contract authority where it's like a wishful spending on certain contracts, how do we make that happen in our schools with our students and the things that they need in the school system as well? Um, so if you want, Mar May 30th, 31st is our next um, budget committee meeting at 5.30. We'll be talking about contract authority and there was one other thing on there which will be in the agenda. Thank you. Um, building contracts, which we do see the out growth of the work that you do, but is there anything you want to add, Ms. Harvey? Uh, yes, thank you. First of all, thank you for the feedback on the structure of our contracts. We will take that into consideration as we move forward. Our next building and contracts meeting is June 12th at 5 p.m. virtually. We invite everyone uh, to attend. And also a reminder to our other committee members, if you have a function in your committee, particularly uh, curriculum and instruction that requires your approval of vetting in order for us to approve a contract, please make sure that we're made aware of that before that contract comes up for a vote. Thank you. Thank you. The next is curriculum committee, which is me. Um, we've spent time um, getting ready for tonight's um, vote on the ELA curriculum. Um, our last meeting, we actually did it in person so that board members could have a chance to actually see the materials on display, to take time to look at them um, before we um, got an in-depth presentation on both of the products and then which ones. We are also moving now towards learning more about um, specifically um, Dibbles as a way to measure how our Open Core program is working. So we also look at upcoming contracts, um, but then we're making a focus on really understanding the literacy piece and how we're monitoring um, achievement. The next group is equity, and that's Dr. Savoy. In the equity meeting of April 13, 2023, Ms. Kira Joseph gave a report reflective of current BCPS graduation rates. The small decrease in the rate is indicative of both state and nationwide school systems. The challenge is largely due to the pandemic. Randallstown High School, for example, presents an increase of 10.6% in its graduation rates and a decrease of 7% in its dropout rates. Mr. Doug Handy gave an enlightening presentation that revealed a direct correlation between poverty and student achievement. He used redlining as one example. He also shared the importance for ninth school. And we found out that the ninth school or the extended day program 
Uh, the facts are that some students are required to work during the day to support their families. So that was. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. The next is um, Ms. Hassan with Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee. Yep. So um, our last meeting was on April 20th. and. It um, for this year, as legislative session has concluded, um, we reviewed um, bills that were passed in the House and the Senate and updates on key legislation. You can see the update on board docs as well. Um, we're also currently actually witnessing um, Governor Moore sign a lot of those bills regarding education, rega especially regarding Baltimore County into law. Just today, um, he did approve um, House Bill 175, which gives my successor voting rights on the budget, um, as well as um, the appointment process um, that is such a, a key and critical factor um, for our board and making sure that we have um, new appointments, I believe, every presidential term rather than just in the middle um, of the whole process. So instead of having um, empty seats like we did this year, we'll have a full board all year round. Um, so those are some things that are really positive and um, regarding Baltimore County and those legislations. Our next meeting will be um, next year um, as we open up the next session. Thank you. And then policy review, we definitely see your work at the board meetings, but do you want to add anything else, Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Um, at the Policy Review Committee's April 24th meeting, the committee received a report on policy 5210, grading and reporting. That policy has been placed on the committee's 2022-2023 schedule. Following a report by staff, the committee had no, no recommended amendments or changes to the policy. Thank you. Next is board member agenda items. Um, so if you have any items you want to have for consideration um, and let us know tonight, or of course you can always let us know um, through email. So does anybody have any items they want to bring up at this point? Okay. That's what happens when it gets really late. Uh, oh, go ahead, Miss. Do you have a definite date of when we can pick up our um, attire for graduation? Um, don't know that, but we'll, Ms. Gober will um, email with that information. Okay, thank you. Um, the last item on the agenda is announcements. Tomorrow, May 17th, 2023, is the board's public hearing on the Central and Northeast Area Middle School Boundary Study Recommendation at the Parkville High School Auditorium. Sign up for speakers begins at 530, and the hearing will begin at 630. On Wednesday, May 24th, 2023, the board will hold a virtual public hearing on the FY 2025 capital budget via a Microsoft Teams live event. The link to register to speak at this hearing will be provided on the participation by the public webpage and can be found in board docs. And the board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, June 13th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned.